Hello, Ellen. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning for us. I think you. Uh, well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, Professor Helen. Uh, welcome to this uh, new session of your lectures. Uh, today, we will continue with the lectures of uh, Professor Helen, and will be titled. Uh, we, she will be talk about adiabatic potential for confining quantum gases. So uh, please welcome to Professor Helen and let's pay attention. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Emmanuel. <clears throat> Good morning, every, everyone. Um, so this is the second lecture and today we will continue. Uh, we have seen yesterday uh, a reminder about Bose-Einstein condensation and why uh, BECs with weak interactions are superfluids. And I have explained also what are collective modes for a trapped superfluid. And today I will take the time to describe uh, in some detail a, the way of building some original potentials uh, to confine quantum gases, which are also very appropriate to study uh, superfluid behavior and collective modes. Uh, so I remind you yesterday why quantum gases are interesting to study superfluidity, because you can tune them, you can adjust temperature. And uh, for uh, these adiabatic potentials, a key feature is that they give you the ability to control and to control in a dynamical way the confinement geometry. So you will be able to make uh, uh, original potentials and to change them in a dynamical way to excite modes in a very controlled way. But that's not all. Within these potentials, uh, you are able to also adjust the temperature of the gas by applying some evaporation cooling. And uh, if you compress the atoms very strongly in one direction, uh, this uh, will lead you to the ability to control the interaction strengths in a 2D potential, for example, in some way. Uh, they are giving you the possibility to make periodic potentials using a series of RF frequencies, or at least double wells. And uh, low dimensional systems are accessible with these adiabatic potentials. So the lecture of today will be divided in uh, three parts. I will first present the principle of adiabatic potentials, how they work. Then I will give you some examples. And if I have time, I will explain you how we prove those potentials to be sure of the parameters and be able to have a very good knowledge of the landscape the atoms are in. Okay, so let me uh, also underline that uh, if you want to know more about those potentials, there were two uh, in-depth reviews on the subject. So this one is like a tutorial 
And this one is a review of recent applications of those potentials uh, that we wrote both of them with Barry Garraway, who is a theoretician in Sussex. So what is the principle of those adiabatic potentials? So let me first uh, recall or, or explain uh, what an adiabatic potential is in very generally. The general idea of uh, adiabatic potential is that you have eigenstates, psi, and eigenenergies, h bar omega, uh, and splitting between these different eigenstates, h bar delta, which depend from some external parameter. Uh, for my case, this external parameter will be the magnetic field and the radio frequency field, but it is very general. It can be position, anything. And so uh, there, this parameter can vary with position or with time. And the idea is that if the variations of these parameters are slow enough, then the atomic state will follow adiabatically the local eigenstate psi of lambda when lambda varies because of time or because of position. So if this is a parameter lambda, imagine that this lambda varies with position and an atom moves inside this landscape. At each position, there is some uh, splitting between the states, these different uh, energies. And the assumption is that if we start in this state here, number two, and we vary in position or time, then the um, atomic state will, will always stay inside this eigenstate of the variable lambda everywhere. So for this to happen, uh, then uh, the variation should be slow. And what the, this means is that they should be uh, slow as compared with the splitting between the different uh, adiabatic states. So here you see that the splitting between two states is the smallest at this point or at that point. And if the variations are too fast, then uh, there may be some coupling and uh, the state can end up uh, in the, the atomic state can end up in this state here. Uh, and this uh, phenomenon is called a lambda zener transition. So if we go too fast, instead of staying in this state here, we could couple to that state here. And so this condition is that the variation of the lambda parameter uh, times the way the state psi depends on this lambda parameter should remain very small as compared to the splitting delta. So either in time or in position, and then the velocity uh, is, uh, appears in the formula. So in our case, psi is a magnetic state which will be dressed by radio frequency photons. And this is our, uh, the ad adiabatic state that the atoms will follow. And the adiabatic potential will be the eigenenergy of this adiabatic state. OK, so let me remind you the uh, theory of interaction between a spin or with some total or some total angular momentum uh, with a magnetic field. So if we have an atom with a total angular momentum f, uh, the uh, operators f squared and the projection of f on some axis z uh, commute and can be diagonalized in the same basis, which is the basis of the eigenstates of fz. So I will call these states m with index z. And the eigenvalues are f, f plus 1, h bar squared for f squared and h bar m for fz. So from these, uh, uh, if we start, for example, from the lowest uh, uh, state of uh, Fz, which is uh, minus F, we can build all the other eigenstates using the F plus and F minus operators, which are Fx plus and minus I Fy. And again, Fx and Fy are projections of F on the axis X and Y. And so if we apply the F plus operator, it raises the eigenstate z from m to m plus one and the f minus operator lowers the eigenstate from m to m minus one. So f plus and f minus, uh, if uh, we add them, we recover the fx operator. So this, you know, that's the usual algebra for spins. So now if we want to couple a spin to a magnetic field, 
the coupling is given by the scalar product of the spin operator with the magnetic field. So for a static magnetic field, for example, the Hamiltonian is F dot B. And so uh, if the magnetic field B is along some direction U, uh, what uh, appears here is the projection of the F operator along the direction U and the eigenstates uh, of the, this Hamiltonian are the spin, uh, of the spin states along the direction U. Uh, so this is a Zeeman effect. Omega zero is called the Lamo frequency and is directly related to uh, the, uh, the strength of the magnetic field. So it's G mu B over H bar B zero. Um, so uh, the eigenenergies, whatever the direction U, by the way, are proportional to the magnetic field, so to the Lamo frequency, and to the projection of the angular momentum, little m. So now, if our magnetic field depends on position, either in strength or in orientation, we are the, exactly in the situation of the adiabatic states, because everywhere at position r, there is some direction and some um, amplitude. And so the local magnetic eigenstates are the m states for the projection along the direction u of r. So these eigenstates, they deepen on the position. So these are adiabatic states in the sense that uh, uh, we have a parameter lambda, which is a direction uh, which depends uh, on the position. And the local energies themselves, uh, they depend on position because the amplitude B of R depends on position. And so the local uh, energy of the adiabatic state acts for the state as a trapping potential. Uh, v uh, with the momentum M will, will be M times uh, this potential. So this is a way we build a magnetic traps by using low field seeking states with a positive uh, value of the coefficient here, um, which can be trapped at a minimum of the magnetic field. So in fact, when you make a magnetic trap, you use uh, adiabatic states. So there are different kinds of uh, magnetic traps. Uh, one of them is the quadruple trap, where you have two coils with opposite directions for the current. There is a zero magnetic field in the center, and then the field increases linearly with position. So this is the expression for the magnetic field. And so if we introduce a gradient in terms of frequency alpha, which is just a gradient of this magnetic field, but in units of frequency, then the associated potential uh, is uh, just proportional to m alpha and then uh, some generalized distance, which is just the modulus of uh, the magnetic field. So this uh, potential gives you uh, a trap for the atoms with uh, low, thing, low field seeking state at the center with a minimum uh, magnetic field, which is zero. Another very well-known configuration is the yofi prechart trap where this time instead of zero, the minimum magnetic field is non-zero. So there is a minimum field, for example, along the direction X, when X, Y, and Z are zero. So some B0 in the center. And when you go away from this B0, then uh, the magnetic field increases. And uh, locally around this point, it, inc it increases quadratically. So this gives you a potential, which is a harmonic potential not a linear potential, around a non-zero minimum field. OK, so now that we have seen that, in fact, these uh, magnetic uh, uh, traps are kind of adiabatic potentials, let's introduce some uh, additional ingredient, which is an oscillating uh, radio frequency field. So this is an oscillating magnetic field at some frequency omega. And uh, as it is still a magnetic field, the Hamiltonian is a sum of a coupling to the static field plus a coupling to this oscillating field that I can write in terms of Lamo frequency and some coupling amplitude, cosine omega t, and the projection of the angular momentum in the direction 
of the uh, polarization of the RF field. So let's assume here for simplicity that we have a linearly polarized RF field in the direction X in this case. This is the Hamiltonian we have. So omega one, which is a coupling between the RF field and the atom is called the Rabi frequency. And in fact, if we use the fact that Fx is like F plus and is a sum of F plus and F minus, uh, we can write the Hamiltonian uh, along the, around the, uh, under this form, where a, you have a cosine which is exponential minus i omega t plus exponential plus i omega t, and fx which is f plus plus f minus. So two terms here, two terms here. Uh, when we develop everything, we expand everything, we should find four terms. So one in exponential minus i omega t with f plus, this one, one with exponential minus i omega t with f minus, and then exponential plus i omega t with f minus, exponential plus i omega t with f plus. So I will call omega plus the coupling for this term here, and omega minus the coupling of this term here. We will see later why. And so in this case, omega plus, it's just half of omega one because we split equivalently the cosine into one half of exponential minus i omega t plus one half of exponential plus i omega t. So omega plus is the weight of the RF polarization on the sigma plus component of the polarization. So if I have a linearly polarized field, omega plus is just one half of the total amplitude. If instead I work with a circularly polarized field, omega plus can be just equal to the full amplitude. Uh, now, in fact, this term, uh, if we look at this term and we go into the uh, frame rotating at a frequency omega around the uh, static field uh, B0, if we do that, we will find that these terms become static. And uh, going into the rotation frame, we'll also modify the term in front of Fz and give us omega zero minus omega Fz, uh, which I can also write under the form minus delta Fz, where delta is a detuning from the magnetic resonance, which is omega minus omega zero. So this term becomes static and becomes just omega plus times Fx. Uh, on the other hand, if I go to this rotating field, this term instead uh, oscillates very fast because I will get a term exponential minus two, two i omega t f y. So applying the rotating wave approximation consists in neglecting this fast oscillating term and just keeping the static term omega plus f x uh, in uh, this expression. So I'm left with just this Hamiltonian, which now is time independent which is easy to diagonalize, and where you can see that only the weight on the circular plus component uh, couples efficiently the atom to the RF field. So this is a big message. When you have uh, any uh, radio frequency field coupled to your atom, in fact, the important component of the polarization that will affect the energy is just the sigma plus polarization, and you can ignore in the first uh, approach the sigma minus, the weight on the sigma minus polarization. Okay, so let's look now at, at this Hamiltonian. What is it like? In fact, it's just a projection of the F operator onto a new direction, U theta, uh, with some amplitude, which is square root, square root of delta squared plus omega plus squared. So this I can just identify as some amplitude and with a cosine theta and some amplitude with the sine theta. And the angle theta is linked to the detuning and the coupling with these uh, equations, whereas the effective field uh, that describes the coupling is given by square root of delta square plus omega plus square. So the Hamiltonian is just the one of a effective magnetic field with an amplitude, which is this amplitude, and a direction, uh, which is given by theta. So if we believe that the atom will follow adiabatically the eigenstates, uh, they will always stay in some m state with m being 
uh, defined by the new direction u theta, and the eigens, the eigen energies will be equal to m h bar square root of delta squared plus omega plus square. And so these eigens energies, they will play the role of a potential for the atoms. So now if the detuning uh, depends on position, because for example, the uh, amplitude of the magnetic field depends on position. And if the coupling depends on position because of a varying coupling amplitude or because the direction of the polarization uh, changes with respect to the direction of the magnetic field, uh, then these two parameters depend on position and we indeed have a potential. So this is the adiabatic potential uh, I have in mind and I will describe in this lecture. So let's take a very simple example where uh, we consider a static magnetic field which depends just linearly with position. So the, if I look at the, the regular Zeeman effect, uh, assume we have an F equal one spin, uh, then uh, if the magnetic field depends linearly with position, one of the states will have an energy which increases linearly. Uh, the M equals to zero state is uh, not affected by the magnetic field. And the uh, next state minus one uh, has an energy which decreases linearly with position. So what the uh, dressing does is that um, at some position, you will apply uh, a field with uh, some uh, photons which have an energy which match the, the Zeeman splitting somewhere at some position. And so this position uh, I call uh, X0, it corresponds to uh, the RF frequency divided by the gradient. So at this position, the splitting between Zeeman state, of course, is alpha X0. Uh, so it is just omega and it matches the uh, photon frequency. And the um, adiabatic potential for this case uh, is just equal to uh, the detuning square. So the detuning is a difference uh, between the Zeeman energy and the photon uh, energy. So it is zero here. And when you go away from X zero, it increases plus omega squared. And the adiabatic potentials in this case look like that. So there is a minimum just at the resonance uh, of the RF uh, transition uh, for the M equals plus one state. M equals zero is unaffected and M equals minus one has a maximum at the very same position. So this, um, if you will look in the dress state basis, what we see is that if we walk in this upper state, we have a minimum in potential just at the position where the RF field is resonant with the Zeeman splitting. So this is in general what the potential looks like. The atoms will be attracted to the positions in space where the resonance occurs. So where your RF field is just uh, equal, where your RF field frequency is just equal to the Zeeman splitting. Um, so if we uh, look uh, more precisely at the uh, chopping frequency we have in these kind of potentials. Uh, and we, we, here we have the potential. If we expand around the minimum, uh, we find that uh, we have a locally a harmonic potential and the trapping frequency to that point uh, scales like the magnetic gradient divided by the square root of the RF coupling. So you will have strongly uh, trapping to this uh, point when the gradient is large and when the uh, RF frequency is small. So um, to, to have a look on, at um, what the potential looks like, uh, we, we want to, to identify what is the minimum uh, of potential everywhere in space. Uh, we may wonder what is the minimum of this uh, expression. In fact, in general, the detuning varies quickly because you cross the resonance somewhere. 
whereas the coupling uh, to the RF field varies slowly. So the position of the minimum is uh, governed to a first approximation by having the detuning zero. So to a good approximation, the minimum of the potential is located on the surface in space, the resonance surface, the isomagnetic surface defined by having the RF field resonant with the Zeeman splitting. So in general, this is a surface in space. And within this surface, uh, then the magnetic field, the, uh, sorry, the potential is just equal to mH bar omega plus of R if delta is zero. And so within this surface, there can be a finer structure where the atoms will be attracted to the point uh, where the potential is minimum inside the surface. So either because gravity is present and so will attract the atoms to the lower part of the surface, or because uh, there is some gradient in the coupling, and so the atoms will be attracted towards the region where the coupling is lowest. Um, so in the first proposal of these uh, traps by uh, Oliver Zobe and Barry Garraway in uh, 2001, the idea was to use a, a harmonic uh, magnetic field and uh, to a, uh, couple the spins with a strong RF field. And if I, I say strong, because this splitting here between the dress state uh, is given by the RF coupling. So this is also clear here. The splitting between the dress state at the minimum point where it is the smallest is the RF coupling. And here I come back to my first graph. Remember the most critical points uh, to stay adiabatic are the places where two adiabatic states are close to each other. And so the best uh, strategy is to have uh, this uh, splitting um, large enough to avoid any uh, transition between adiabatic states. So that's why you need a strong enough RF field to create adiabatic potentials. And then uh, the adiabatic, uh, the, the atoms are confined to these azomagnetic surfaces defined by the amplitude of the magnetic field is equal to um, the RF frequency, if you put the right units, or in other words, the surface is defined by the Larmor frequency is equal to the RF frequency. So let me consider. Um, uh, typical potentials you can uh, you can do with these uh, techniques. So here uh, I took a, a general case where you have a minimum of the magnetic field because, for example, you have a Yofi Pritchard trap, and you look at the positions of the isomagnetic surfaces around this minimum. So typically, uh, it's ellipsoids around the, the trap minimum. So having the condition for trapping means that uh, once you set the value of the RF frequency, you trap the atoms on the isomagnetic surface defined by the RF frequency. So it's one particular choice of the RF frequency. This is the surface where the atoms are confined. So if I choose another RF frequency, for example, a smaller one, I will confine the atoms on another surface. So you see that here we have a nice tuning. When we change the array frequency, we change uh, the size of the uh, surface over which the atoms are confined. So now if you add gravity, uh, you will typically have a flat trap at the bottom of some surface. And uh, now if you, if you take into account the fact that you can have some inhomogeneities in the RF coupling, you can also uh, have the situation where instead of some uh, homogeneous surface, you can create a double well where at two points, the uh, RF amplitude is lowest and you will attract the atoms at those two points. So let me now describe a, what kind of a potentials you can create using these uh, adiabatic potentials. Uh, I will start 
with the situation where the underlying magnetic field is a Yofi Pritchard field, so that I presented before, uh, with some non-zero uh, value of the magnetic field in the center. And around this non-zero value, the magnetic field increases quadratically. Uh, so you will typically have for the isomagnetic surfaces, ellipsoids with uh, different radii along one direction and the other. So this, this is a situation in which we demonstrated the first uh, dressed uh, RF trap. Uh, it was a Yofi Pritchard trap. And uh, once we introduce some RF field and we increase the frequency, you see that the minimum of potential will be around uh, this kind of surface and with larger average frequency, here is the surface over which the atoms are confined. Uh, now, the experiment was uh, performed in the presence of gravity. So in fact, the minimum of potential is more like below, uh, at the bottom of this surface. So here are pictures uh, of the atoms taken inside the trap. So this is the initial situation in a Yofi Pritchard trap. And once we dress the atoms, uh, the uh, atoms are confined along some ellipsoid and are at the bottom of this surface. And when we increase the RF frequency, uh, they are following the isomagnetic uh, surface, with, which is set by the value of the RF frequency. So uh, you can see that everywhere, the atoms follow very nicely some ellipsoid uh, imposed by the landscape of the magnetic field. Uh, because of gravity, the atoms are at the bottom of this, uh, of this structure. But if you walk not with a, a BEC, but with a thermal gas that is able to have higher energy, uh, you can nicely see that the whole bubble can be populated with larger fraction at the bottom, but atoms everywhere uh, because of a non-zero temperature. So the idea of filling this bubble with atoms everywhere uh, is something that is also very nice. And people have uh, started to uh, send atoms in, on the, uh, send, send an experiment with cold atoms on the International Space Station. And one of the goals of this experiment uh, in this International Space Station, which relies on an atom chip, uh, is to produce some of these bubbles in space with the aim of filling completely the bubble by getting rid of the of gravity. So where are they with this experiment? They were able to produce a BEC in 2020 uh, in the International Space Station. And the most recent experiments trying to fill the bubble are uh, have been uh, uh, put on the archive uh, last summer. And so they do not quite fill the bubble because of uh, inhomogeneity in the coupling. So it is really hard to get rid of that. But still, you can see that a large fraction of the bubble is, uh, is populated. So now if I come back to the uh, Yofi Pritchard trap, there are other ways uh, to take advantage of the uh, magnetic field landscape. Uh, by this time, using the fact that if you uh, your uh, RF field is linearly polarized along the horizontal direction. Then the projection onto the circular field, uh, so the omega plus coupling, uh, depends on position. In fact, it's not the same everywhere. Omega plus will be larger at the top and bottom of the um, uh, ellipsoid surface and will be lower uh, on the axis. And as a result, as uh, the potential uh, on the surface of the bubble is essentially h bar omega plus, you will have two minima of the potential uh, in the horizontal direction. So this uh, has been uh, used uh, in the group of uh, Jörg Spittmeier to produce double wells uh, with very elongated gases, which are elongated uh, perpendicular to my screen. And the splitting between these double waves is controlled by the value of the RF frequency. So if you increase the RF frequency, you work with a larger uh, ellipsoid with those two minima, which are further apart. And so you can have them further and further apart by increasing the frequency, uh, which you can nicely see on these pictures. 
And uh, this experiment has been used to observe in different fringes uh, between uh, condensates uh, with a controlled separation between uh, the, the clouds, uh, the separation being controlled by the control on the RF frequency and RF amplitude. So you can see that these uh, potentials are really um, uh, nice to make very precise and controlled experiment with uh, funny and arbitrary geometries. So finally, always with the with this uh, Yofi Pritchard trap, uh, it is possible by tailoring uh, the uh, uh, RF polarization uh, to have a minimum of potential, which is really uh, everywhere along uh, the um, radius of the ellipsoid. Uh, but uh, in fact, if you look at the full ellipsoid, uh, there is a minimum of potential along the long axis. So the atoms can be everywhere radially, but longitudinally, they will be concentrated uh, around the center. So as a result, the total potential is a ring, and the atoms uh, are uh, confined along some uh, uh, like a cigar bag uh, around the, the ellipsoid. And this uh, has been proposed uh, in 2006 and realized in the group of Dada Anderson uh, 10 years later, where they were able to observe atoms uh, confined on a ring uh, just realized by uh, RFE. So in this experiment, there were also atoms in the center. That's why you see a peak in the center, but the ring uh, all around. So now let me consider another uh, initial magnetic field geometry, uh, namely a quadrupole field. So the, the field I presented initially with two coils with opposite currents. So in this case, you have a magnetic field, which is a spherical quadrupole with a field increasing linearly along the direction x and y. And of course, to fulfill the Maxwell uh, equations, uh, the gradient in the third direction is twice as large with a negative sign. So if I look, for example, along the direction x, the three Zeeman states uh, are split um, and evolve linearly with position uh, like that, m equals to minus one, zero, and plus one. And so if I apply a RF field with some given frequency, it will be resonant with the Larmo frequency at some position. Uh, so now uh, this is equivalent to have a minimum uh, of potential for the dress state at this resonant position. And this gives us a, an isomagnetic surface, uh, which uh, corresponds to a modulus of B0 being equal to some value. Uh, so the uh, isomagnetic surfaces are ellipsoids with a radius proportional to the RF frequency divided by the gradient. So if I look at these ellipsoids, they, they are like that. In fact, there is a factor of two for the ready in the vertical and horizontal direction, which comes from the initial factor of two in the gradient in the vertical direction with respect to the horiz horizontal one. Uh, so seen uh, in, in a cut in the vertical plane, uh, this is a potential we have. And the atoms gather at the bottom of these uh, ellipsoids uh, because of gravity. And so if we look at what's happening at the, around the, uh, near the potential minimum, we have a transverse vertical trapping, which is linked to the uh, uh, avoided crossing and, and to the adiabatic potential. So that which case like the magnetic gradient divided by the coupling and which can be large, a few hundred Hertz up to a few kilohertz. And the horizontal trapping frequencies are directly linked to the fact that we have a pendulum-like oscillation. The atoms have to uh, leave on this ellipsoid. So it's almost like a pendulum uh, oscillating at fixed uh, length uh, of the uh, pendulum. And so that's why you have a frequency in square root of G uh, divided by the radius R0. And so these frequencies are slow, typically a few tens of Hertz. So we are in a situation where the gas is very flat with a very large difference between vertical and horizontal 
confinement. So it is well appropriate to study two-dimensional uh, superfluidity, for example, or two-dimensional dynamics for the gases. And that's what we, we did a lot in the group. And everything is controllable in this geometry. Uh, for example, you can control a, the anisotropy of these 2D gas, uh, so the ratio between the uh, horizontal frequencies along two directions, by controlling the direction of the RF polarization. Uh, because just a sigma plus component is, uh, is relevant. So if you break the rotational symmetry, uh, you will have an anisotropic, anisotropic uh, 2D trap. Whereas if you choose a polarization which is rotationally invariant, for example, sigma plus along the z direction, then you will get a rotationally invariant trap and a perfectly isotropic uh, trap. And this uh, geometry can be modified dynamically, which is uh, ideal to study the collective modes of a 2D gas. And that's uh, the way uh, we produce a 2D gas I showed you yesterday with the different excited modes. So this is exactly uh, the situation in which the experiments that I showed you yesterday have been performed. And so uh, these are the, the collective modes I presented you yesterday and seen from the top, uh, the, the gas in situ looks like that when we have decided to set some small anisotropy. And we can also use this uh, geometry to produce a vortex lattice by uh, deforming the gas along one direction and rotating this deformation uh, to drag the gas and uh, create a vortex lattice uh, in the trap. So now if we uh, combine adiabatic potentials with RF and optical potentials, we can enlarge the uh, different, different uh, magnetic, uh, the different uh, potentials that we can create. And uh, one typical potential that can be uh, obtained doing that is a ring trap. So the idea is to start from the bubble trap I showed you just before, and to add some light potential that will confine the atoms in the vertical direction. So what it will do is to impose the vertical position of the cloud. So now if we move the uh, bubble, which can be done by adding a vertical magnetic field, which shifts the zero of the quadrupole field downwards, then uh, in principle, if we shift the bubble, the atoms will stay at the bottom and be shifted uh, again uh, all together with the bubble. But if you have the light on, then they cannot go down. They, they have to stay at this height. So when you lower the bubble, the atoms will climb on the edges and occupy a location, which is the intersection of the bubble with a plane, and this is just a ring. So this technique has been applied to, to create ring traps. Um, th so that's something we, we propose and what's first uh, implemented in the group of Chris Food in Oxford. And we also uh, implemented the same technique in, in our group to have a ring traps where the, what is nice is that you can tune the diameter of the ring uh, as you wish. Uh, because you can tune the size of the bubble by changing the frequency, and you can also decide to lower the bubble uh, more or less. And so this uh, movie is obtained by lowering the bubble more and more. And this one is obtained by uh, intersecting um, bubbles with different radii uh, with the same uh, light sheet. And finally, I would like to mention also what uh, we can obtain when we use multiple array frequencies, so not just one, but several uh, different frequencies. So in this case, each time you have an avoided crossing, so each time you have a resonance with one of the frequencies, um, the adiabatic potential changes direction. Uh, so here, for example, you have a first RF field, so you have a, a minimum for your trap. Uh, it is just like the uh, bubble I presented before. But now if you have another RF field, 
with a larger frequency, you will have yet another avoided crossing. And a third one, uh, yet another avoided crossing, et cetera, et cetera. So with this technique, you can imagine uh, to build something like a lattice, or uh, at least uh, with three frequencies, one, two, three, build a double well. And so uh, this has been realized in the group of Chris Foot. So with three frequencies, uh, here you have the center of the magnetic field, a first avoided crossing, second avoided crossing to create a barrier between the two wells, and third avoided crossing, third frequency uh, for the second minimum. And so this double well uh, can be tuned in terms of population between the two wells by uh, playing with the different RF frequencies and polarization. So this is an example where uh, they can tune uh, the population imbalance and the depth uh, of the barrier uh, with, uh, by, by tuning the uh, RF frequency of one of the RF fields. And this uh, situation can be even generalized to the case where you have different spin states. And so this uh, has been also done in the group of Chris Foot. Uh, so this graph is just a cut uh, of images like this one. You take just the central part. So here, for example, it means that you have two wells, one on top of each other, whereas here you just have one. And uh, what is interesting in this situation is that there is a mixture between the two hyperphone states of rubidium, F equals to one and two. And they managed to have a situation where for one of the spin states, you just have one minimum. And for the other one, you have a double well. And by changing a parameter, you can go from the situation where the double well is for F equals two to the situation where the double well is for F equals one. So these um, analytic potentials also allow the uh, state sensitive manipulation of different spin states or even uh, species selective if you use uh, two species with different signs of the uh, gyromagnetic factor. And uh, using multiple frequencies, the last thing I wanted to show you is that you can um, generalize these uh, adiabatic potentials to a time varying adiabatic potentials. So well, the idea is to start with the uh, bubble I was mentioning. So it is a dress quadruple trap. And now this uh, potential, you shake it with time. So at a frequency, which is slow as compared to the average frequency, but fast uh, as compared to the dynamics uh, of the atoms moving in the trap. So if you do so, for example, you shake it vertically, then the new minimum uh, for the average potential, where you average in time, is a ring. And so with that system, you can produce a ring with just uh, a modulated uh, RF and magnetic fields without any light, so without some roughness. And this uh, is uh, uh, used, for example, in an experiment in Crete by Wolf von Klitzing to build atom interferometers with very, very, very low roughness. So with this technique, you can build rings. Uh, so this was also first demonstrated in the, in the group of uh, Chris Foot, but uh, also used in the group of Wolf von Klitzing. And you can also, in fact, uh, produce double wells with the same, uh, same technique. So my last uh, section uh, is about uh, probing adiabatic potentials to characterize them. Uh, because you uh, control them very well with uh, RF fields, magnetic field, polarization of the RF field. But it's uh, sometimes a bit difficult to uh, know in advance everything of your field and compute the potential. The best approach is more to uh, realize your potential and then probe what you have uh, with um, RF probes to get a very precise characterization of your potential. So for uh, describing uh, how to probe the uh, adiabatic potential, and in particular, 
how to be sure of the amplitude of your uh, sigma plus coupling omega plus, which is something very critical for the trap. Uh, let me uh, go to the uh, full quantum approach to describe the RF field. So instead of writing the RF field with exponential i omega t as I did before, I will introduce the A and A dagger operators for annihilation and creation of RF photons. So in this case, the RF field I can write under uh, some amplitude with some projection on the sigma plus and sigma minus polarization. Uh, times the annihilation operator R uh, plus the Hamiltonian conjugate. Uh, so the uh, full Hamiltonian for the spin plus the field is given by uh, this expression. So of course, this is the spin Hamiltonian in the absence of RF field with the Lamont frequency times Fz. The RF field uh, has an energy H by H bar omega A dagger A, so counting the number of photons. And then the RF uh, coupling to the spin uh, has a component which is the resonant uh, component with omega plus and the off resonant coupling uh, omega minus. So it's clear here that it's resonant because you have a term where a photon is annihilated once you create an excitation in the spin. So it preserves the number of excitation, destroys an excitation in the field and creates an excitation in the spin. And the Hamiltonian conjugate creates a photon and destroys an excitation in the spin. Whereas the off resonant either destroys two excitations or create two excitations. So what are the uh, energies when we don't have any coupling, just the spin and the field without coupling? Uh, so the states are just a state where you give the spin uh, state and the field state. The spin is M and the field contains N photons. And for this state, the energy is just M H bar omega zero for the spin plus big N uh, H bar omega for the field. So this, uh, if I introduce the detuning, which is omega minus omega zero, I can write under the form minus little m h bar delta plus uh, big N plus big M plus little m h bar omega. So this is the number of excitation n plus m uh, and uh, the different uh, uh, states can be split by a little delta. So how, how are the energies of these uncoupled states if I look? Uh, let's take the example of F, F equals to one. In fact, uh, these uh, states are grouped uh, in manifolds where the energy is uh, very small between different states inside the manifold and the energy uh, difference is large between different manifolds. Uh, so what is a manifold? It's, it's a, a, an ensemble of states for which the excitation n plus m is the same. For example, uh, m equals to zero with n photon or m equals to minus one with n plus one photon and m equals one with n minus one photon have almost the same energy. If we are at uh, zero detuning, they have exactly the same energy and the energy difference inside the manifold is just this little h bar delta. Whereas between uh, m equals to zero n and m equals to zero n plus one, the energy difference is large. It's, it's a, a RF photon. So uh, it's clear that everything will happen uh, inside one of these uh, multiplicity and not between multiplicities. And indeed, uh, so this manifold, I, I call them uh, EN. And indeed, um, the coupling uh, omega plus occurs inside the manifold, because if I change uh, m by one unit, if I go to, from m to m plus one, then I remove one photon uh, or vice versa. Whereas the omega minus uh, coupling is between manifolds split by two h bar omega. And so the coupling, if I take into account the, the value is about omega plus inside a manifold and omega minus between manifolds. So it, it looks like that. Inside the manifold, I have this coupling omega plus, which will uh, uh, describe essentially the physics. 
And between manifolds split by two h bar omega, I have this coupling omega minus, which in general I can neglect if h bar omega is much larger than h bar delta. So I will concentrate on uh, what's happening just inside a manifold. Uh, so this is uh, my, my manifold number n. Uh, these three uncoupled states are minus one and plus one photon, zero and photons, and one and minus one photons. And because of the uh, RF coupling, now these uh, new uh, dress states, they're a little bit shifted in energy because the new energies are given by square root of delta squared plus omega plus squared, as I said before. So the new uh, dress states are those three states. And uh, to measure this omega plus a uh, coupling, what we do is to perform spectroscopy between these dress states by applying some RF probe, either directly at small energy between states in the same multiplicity. So it will be a resonance for uh, uh, RF photons with energies on the order of uh, omega plus, or uh, between uh, different multiplicities. And this time, the resonant frequencies occurs at omega minus big omega, or omega plus big omega. So we expect to have uh, three lines one at small frequencies, uh, frequency equal to the RF coupling, and two at frequencies close to the RF dressing frequency um, split by the RF coupling. And that's indeed what we observe. So these are the two uh, lines where uh, we have resonances at uh, the RF frequency plus minus the RF coupling. And uh, this spectrum here is obtained by uh, directly sending a probe at the uh, RF coupling. So using this kind of uh, techniques, we can completely characterize uh, the, the trap geometry and all the couplings. So I think I will skip. Um, I, OK, let me just mention that with the same kind of RF coupling, we can uh, apply an RF knife and control the temperature in the trap. So by directly coupling the states uh, between them, uh, we can uh, expel the atoms with enough energy and cool down the atoms inside the dress trap. And what I, I will skip is the part where uh, we, when we go to very large RF couplings, uh, then it's not completely true that we can neglect the omega minus um, coupling between uh, multiplicities. And so this uh, has been studied in particular in the group of, of Jörg Schmidt-Meyer. And so I will skip it because I am a bit late and I will come to my conclusion. Uh, so to, uh, for, to summarize what we have seen today, uh, adiabatic potentials are a very nice tool for manipulating ultra-cold atoms or quantum gases. With this kind of, uh, uh, of potentials, you can realize double whales. You can prepare two-dimensional gases. You can prepare ring traps and, in fact, many more geometries. And tomorrow, I will discuss uh, what kind of experiments you can uh, do using the bubble geometry corresponding to the dress quadruple trap. So thanks for your attention. Thank you, Professor Helen, uh, for her wonderful talk. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Professor Van der Leyen. Uh, hi, Helen. I was just, uh, this is a kind of a futuristic idea. Uh, for doing those uh, uh, shell Potentials, you, you normally have a static field, magnetic field, and also a kind of static uh, radio frequency uh, field with some antenna. Do you think that uh, would be possible to do a dynamical type of trap where we pulse the RF? Because in that way, we could eventually have the two frequencies together and then uh, produce a kind of... Uh, onion structure of uh, minimums uh, as a function of the radio. It's like producing um, 
a lattice made, is made of shells that uh, go from the beginning up. Yeah, so in fact, that's the idea of, uh, of this proposal by uh, Philippe Corté. Uh, oh. You don't have to pulse them. You can have them on all the time. Uh, so with uh, a, uh, a comb of frequencies, uh, you have uh, onion shells, one inside the other. And in fact, with just two frequencies, you don't have two uh, shells because uh, one would correspond to a minimum of trapping, whereas the other one would correspond to a maximum. So to have two shells, you need three frequencies, one to trap, one to create the uh, barrier, and the next one to trap. And so this is uh, what was realized in the group of uh, Chris Foote, where in fact the atoms are at the bottom uh, for this experiment, but you can, you can imagine here that you have two shells one inside the other. That's what you have in this experiment. So with three frequencies, you have uh, two shells, but with more frequencies, then you have uh, more and more shells. So this is, this is doable and without pulsing, just with, uh, with the RF on all the time. Thank you. Uh, another question? Well, I have one question, actually. Uh, so, Professor, you when you uh, apply the RF uh, on the quadrupole trap, for example, you make transfer of the uh, Seaman levels in the F equal one state, right? But if you, for example, use a microwave transition to couple the F equal one to, with the F equal two level, can you create a mixture of uh, F equal two and F equal one uh, spin state in the, in the bubble? Uh, okay, so two remarks there. Um, first, you could uh, realize dress traps with uh, microwaves directly. And in fact, the first uh, demonstration in the last 80s was done uh, uh, by a, um, uh, it, there was Chris Westbrook involved, and uh, so I don't remember exactly who, uh, were. In fact, they, they realized a, a trap uh, which was more relying on variation of the coupling than on variation of the detuning. Uh, so it's more light shift, in fact, what they, they did. Uh, but now if we come back to our RF traps, if you add some microwave, this also has been done recently, so I didn't mention that. And uh, in fact, it, it gets quite complicated because just one state is trapped, the, for example, F equals one, M equals plus one, say, say like that. And now if you couple this state to other F equals two states, um, it will mix all the states together, trapped states with untrapped states. And so what will happen in general will be that you will have losses and the microwave uh, is used to, to probe uh, very accurately also the potential. So what I show you uh, for uh, probing uh, the RF potential with RF photons, you can also do it with microwave photons and identify all the different lines. Uh, there are plenty of different lines. So it's, a, it's something which has developed recently in the recent, let's say three, five years, a spectroscopy of these traps with, with microwaves. And lastly, I would like to mention that uh, in the experiment of Wolf von Klitzing with a ring, uh, his idea is uh, to, to realize interferometers because in this, uh, in this situation, uh, it's not that he applies a microwave, but that he is using two different uh, states, one in F equals two, the other one in F equals one, and the potentials are different for the two states. And so as they are different, he can rotate one species in one direction and the other one in the other direction. And the idea is to use that to measure uh, the rotation of, of Earth uh, on a ring uh, with the uh, interferometry, uh, manipulating the, the different uh, high performance states. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, so we have uh, one question on the people on YouTube from Gustavo. So congratulations, Professor Helen, another great lecture. 
I wonder why one cannot cancel our the gravity sack in the RF draft using an extra constant magnetic field. And what are the typical sizes and frequency limitation of the RF drafts? So if you were applying a constant magnetic field, it would just shift the magnetic field structure. So you have to remember that the atoms will always occupy the isomagnetic surface. So if you add some uh, magnetic field or magnetic field gradient, you change the skeleton of the magnetic field landscape. So you also change the position where the atoms are. For example, uh, there's a bubble trick with the ring. Uh, if we use the usual uh, quadruple field, we have this position for the minimum. If we add some static field, it will shift the center of the bubble and the whole bubble will shift. So it will not change uh, the gravity compensation. Okay. Uh, now, if you want to compensate for gravity, that's something I will uh, discuss a little bit tomorrow. Uh, you could add something which is completely different like a many, um, optical field gradient. This was already in a proposal by, by Barry and Garraway. Uh, or we use something different, which is a gradient in the coupling. Uh, but still, uh, it does not solve some other issue, which is that uh, now the transverse uh, coupling, the transverse trapping to the bubble depends on the RF coupling, which can vary locally. So here you see in this example, you see that here, uh, the width of the bubble is larger than there. And this, in fact, is the uh, signature of the fact that the RF coupling is smaller here. So the transverse frequency is tighter. It confines much strongly there than here. So even if we compensate for gravity in this bubble, it will not be completely homogeneous because here the transverse confinement frequency is larger than there. And the last uh, part of the question I forgot. Can you, can you repeat maybe, uh, Emmanuel? Well, thank you, Professor Helene. And oh, I think that. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, OK. So he asked for uh, what are the typical sizes and the frequency ah, yes, limitation the of the yeah. yeah. OK, so typical size, you can uh, change a lot. Uh, so the smaller we have done is a radius of uh, 20 micrometers uh, or a bit less in the horizontal direction. So like 10 vertically and 20 horizontally. The largest we have done uh, is 300 micrometer, but in the experiment of Wolf von Kissing, he went up to a radius of one millimeter, I think, in his uh, very uh, smooth rings for uh, atom interferometry. So the size, you can really uh, change a lot. And uh, the oscillation frequencies uh, are in the range of a few hertz to a one or two kilohertz. And here the limitation is that the more you confine and uh, the higher probability you have to have losses. So here it is something I have not uh, described, but you, if you, we confine more and more, which is uh, this situation, then uh, the lifetime in our trap is smaller because you increase the probability of Landau's analysis. So typically, you cannot really uh, go to a very, very large transverse uh, confinement frequency. Uh, one or two kilohertz is probably uh, the maximum. OK. OK. Now, uh, thank you, Professor. And let's thank the professor again, please. <laughs> so that's all. Um, thank you, Professor. <laughs> Bye. So.
estava aqui ontem. <risos> Faz uma diferença mesmo. Now, Bira's second lecture. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Lucas. Okay, so uh, I covered amazingly little last time, um, and it was mostly a uh, sort of qualitative description of the ideas. I started talking about universality in general, and then specialized to few body systems, and I tried to argue that effect field theory is the way to incorporate that universality, and as I said, all was relatively general. Now, uh, we're going to work a bit harder, and I'm going to describe uh, how this plays out in the two-body system in a little bit of detail so you get a sense of what the calculations uh, involve. And uh, in doing so, I'm going to illustrate aspects that are very important to, to an effect field theory in particular renormalization. Um, I hope to uh, get at least to these three uh, topics uh, today, uh, maybe even getting to bosons, which is the most interesting part. Um, well, let's see how it, how it goes. So this is a slide that I showed already uh, last time. The type of effect field theory that I'm concerned here, simple one particle, with a certain mass, so I'm going to consider several of these this particles with this mass, and uh, consider energies that are much smaller than the mass, so these are non-relativistic systems. Nevertheless, I'm going to impose Lorentz invariance, that means simply that I can correct for uh, relativity uh, in a systematic way, assume the simplest uh, thing about symmetries, parity and time reversal and particle number, I mean we could consider uh, violations of these properties. If you're interested in an atomic system, for example, that has uh, time reversal violation, we could include time reversal interactions, but uh, for simplicity, we're not going to look into that. And then the most general Lagrangian um, consists of uh, the kinetic uh, type terms. As I mentioned, two-body interactions, three-body interactions, four-body interactions, and so on. And it looks very fancy because I'm using this in this slide, this field theory language. But in the end, um, the quantum field theory in this particular case is just going to boil down to non-relativistic quantum mechanics with given potentials. In this particular case, contact interaction, uh, delta function potentials. So let's look at the two-body system. So by this logic, my, my potential is going to consist in here in momentum space. Uh, con uh, the delta function is a, uh, just a constant. Um, I'll have derivatives of, of the delta function interaction with a different coefficient and so on. And then what we need to do then is to solve, uh, in the two-body system, solve the dynamical equation, and you might choose to solve the Liebmann-Schwinger equation. That's what comes more naturally in field theory. Um, you calculate directly the T matrix, which is up to a sign according to my, my choice of, of, of uh, phases here, the, uh, the potential, and then uh, the term that uh, uh, involves both the potential and the amplitude. So this is an integral equation. And uh, you can show this is standard textbook uh, stuff. You can show that the lippmann schwinger equation is equivalent to the Schrodinger equation. The subtlety here is that in general, uh, since I'm not making any assumptions of locality and so on, it's just um, the most general pot uh, potential consistent with the symmetries, um, when I go when I look at the Schrodinger equation in coordinate space, the potential in general is going to be non-local. So this is a bit perhaps unfamiliar to some of you, um, uh, but well, it's still the Schrodinger equation uh, just with, uh, with a non-local potential. So I'm going to actually solve this in front of your eyes. Uh, so I'm going to probably shock you guys, but I'm going to 
solve both the Lippmann Schrodinger equation or sketch the solution of both the Lippmann Schrodinger equation and the Schrodinger equation at leading order and at next to leading order. So, brace for impact. So, let's start with uh, leading order. So, contact interaction is uh, just a constant in momentum space, as I said. And here I Fourier transform in full glory the full uh, non local potential. But it's just, it has a delta function, so it is local uh, because of this delta function. So uh, it's just the usual direct, direct delta function there. And let me first look at the Lippmann Schrodinger equation and um, with this simple potential. So I have to solve this equation here where this is a constant and here I have a constant. So I can pull this out of the integral here and I have an integral that involves only the T matrix and the energy. Remember K is, is my energy is K square over, over M. So this is just the energy. So you see that the only place where P, the P doesn't appear on this side here, this is also a constant, this guy here also doesn't have P. P prime appears only here, so it's likely that if I assume that there is no dependence on P prime, then it's not going to appear anywhere. So I'm going to make an unsat that the amplitude at leading order is just dependent of the energy. And I factor out a irrelevant for pi over m here in front. So this is an unsat. I take this, I plug it into the equation, and then I have just an algebraic manipulation to get to this form here. So as I said, I just put this, this comes out of the integral, this comes out of the integral, I send this to the other side, I have a T2 on this side, I divide, I get this formula here where I is an integral. So before I talk about this integral, just look at this form. This is just a geometric series, which is equivalent to just the sum of diagrams here when this guy is a constant. So I could have done the calculation that way as well. Uh, so what's this integral? Well, this integral here is just that I pull out the, the T2 out of the integral in the integral equation, the, the V2 out of the integral. So I was left, I'm left with this integral here, which is nothing but what's called the Schrodinger propagator here, because you have a difference in energy between the initial state with this energy and the intermediate state with that uh, momentum, L squared, so L squared over M is the energy of that intermediate state. So this should be somewhat familiar. Um, and then I can, this depends only on the magnitudes, I can do the integral over angles, and I get this form here. And it looks like everything is very nice, except that if you look a little bit about uh, at this integral, you see that it diverges. Why does it diverge? Well, when L is very large, this integral in principle could you think goes to infinity. When L is large, you can neglect this K here, cancel the L, you have an integral of DL that goes all the way to infinity. So this is divergent. Um, so what do you do about that? Well, you have to do what's called a regularization. And many people think this is a property of field theory, not per se. It happens here in this quantum, uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanical problem. Um, so we're going to have to make this integral finite somehow. And there are several ways of doing that. The simplest way is to say that to replace my initial uh, potential by something, by, by a, a function of P and P prime that decreases when P uh, and P prime are very large. So I'm just dampening those, those modes. If I do that, then what my integral gets replaced by the integral with this function, which kills the high momentum. Uh, and now the integral is going to be, to be finite. That's not the only way of doing this. 
Um, one favorite among particle physicists is what's called dimensional regularization. You replace the integral d3l by an integral over another number of dimensions that I'm calling d, which is smaller so that the integral is less divergent. And then to keep the dimensions, you correct with, with a factor here. Uh, I'm not going to mention much about uh, this, this method because it's uh, not very uh, useful. It, it applies here, but it's not useful in the main body uh, case. Um, one can show that if you subtract all the poles, so the divergences appear as poles in this, uh, in this dimension that you introduce, and if you subtract all the poles, in the end, you get the same result as a cutoff. Another favorite way of regularizing is closer to this, uh, to this one here. In this one here, I'm multiplying C by some arbitrary functions of, well, arbitrary with these conditions here, that depend on the momentum of the particles. Uh, I could replace by another function, which is function of the momentum transfer p minus p prime. Um, this is a uh, non-separable regulator in the sense that it's, it's not now a product of p and p prime. It's nicer for people who like to work in coordinate space because it gives rise to, in coordinate space, my delta function is replaced by a smear delta function. Uh, in momentum space, you cannot solve this analytically, so I'm going to stick as an example with this, this uh, regularization here, just uh, to do some analytic uh, calculations. So I'm going to take in particular the simplest one, which is just what's called a sharp cutoff. I just say I have contributions from momenta up to lambda and nothing above it. So it's a theta function, a step function, and um, well, then my integral, instead of being from zero to infinity, becomes just an integral from zero to this arbitrary number lambda. Zero to lambda, and I can now can do this integral. I have a term that is just proportional to lambda. Then I have a term that is now, so what I do is I add and subtract k square here. I get this first term. I had the second term with k square in an integral that now converges. So this integral I can calculate up to terms that vanish when lambda goes to infinity. This integral here is calculable. You do a little contour integration and you get ik for this integral. This is what's called the unitary, the unitarity term. It's no analytic in energy um, and uh, has always to be there because it's not dependent on any of the properties of the potential. So with this particular regulator, I got this plus that. This term is independent of the regulator, is always going to be there. As I said, uh, if I change a regulator of this uh, separable type, I'm always going to have this uh, uh, term proportional to lambda times a number that now might be different from two over pi, but it's going to be some number of order one that depends on the regulator. If I look at the first term here, it's also going to have another number that depends on the regulator and I can go on, go on forever. So I'm going to actually use this more general form here, plugging back into the equation that I have here for, for the amplitude. And I have my expression for T2. So now comes the most important step. At this point, my amplitude depends on this arbitrary lambda. This lambda didn't exist when I started this, uh, this game. And now all of a sudden it's there. So the next step is to make my result for observables. The T matrix is un related to the S matrix directly as an observable. I want to make this result independent of my arbitrary choice of regulator. So how do I do that? Well, I simply say that my C00, my constant, is not really a constant when I vary lambda. It's a function of lambda, so I will demand that this combination here, that be a constant independent of, of lambda and related to an observable. 
So I say that my bare parameter that appears in the, in the Lagrangian, it depends on lambda, is some constant which is fixed by data minus a, the part that depends on, on the cutoff. So this cancels against the part that comes from I. And when I do that, my amplitude takes a simple form here. So let's look at this form. So it has a term that is no larger than my next to leading order contributions. Uh, remember my effective range naturally would be a number of order uh, of the range of the potential, which is the inverse of the scale that uh, the high energy scale. So as long as lambda is bigger than that, uh, then that scale, this term is not going to be larger than terms from the effective range, which I hope to recover at NLO. So I don't have to worry about these terms. And the ones that remain are not, are totally well behaved, no infinities, no cutoff dependence. And I can then compare with data. So now I go the, look at the basic properties of this amplitude here, I can see that one, it has a pole at imaginary momentum corresponding to the inverse of this finite number. And there is only one pole. So depending on the sign of this, uh, of this uh, couple, uh, renormalized coupling constant here, it can be a virtual state or a bound state. The unitarity limit that I mentioned before is simply when this, this term goes to the, uh, the C0 is so large that this uh, term is effectively zero. So this form also incorporates the unitarity limit. And if I compare with the low energy expansion, the effective range expansion that I had before, I see that this term is just the inverse of the scattering length. And because it was, it's also related to the binding energy, sorry, I forgot an index two here. That means that at this level of approximation, I have a single bound state and the binding momentum, this kappa, is, relay, is identical to the scattering length. But this is just of the effective range expansion form, just the first term of the effective range uh, expansion. So one can say that this is, I'm deriving the effective range expansion. So this was a calculation from the Lippmann-Schwinger equation. You might not be very familiar with the Lippmann-Schwinger equation. You might like the Schrodinger equation better. So I'm going to redo the same thing, but now in only one slide for the Schrodinger equation. So if you remember, I, this, is, this is a potential in, in coordinate space, but this is just delta function of R prime minus R, so this potential is local. So my Schrodinger equation in this case reduces to that. Well, it should be delta R of the wave function, the leading order wave function at R equals zero because I'm multiplying by delta of R. So this is the, uh, the Schrodinger equation for the delta function. Now, I wonder if you guys ever solved the Schrodinger equation for a delta function potential in three dimensions. I'm sure that in quantum mechanics courses, you solve the equation for one dimension, the delta function for one dimension. I hope you did. And that's simple, right? You just consider an incoming wave. You look at the reflection transmission coefficients. You match things at the delta function and so on. In three dimensions, it's a bit more complicated. And the best way of doing this is to go to momentum space. So you Fourier transform. So you consider the Fourier transform of the wave function. Fourier transform of this guy here is minus p. Uh, so I'm multiplying by minus 1. And here on the right-hand side, I have the coordinate space wave function at 0. But this is just a constant. So this is a constant. So in momentum space, my uh, Schrodinger equation is much simpler. The one problem that I need to worry a little bit about is that, well, this is just a number, so I want to divide both sides by, by this number, but if k is real, uh, if k squared is, is, is positive, then this can have a zero. So I'm going to first consider simplest case, which is bound, it's a bound state, where k is imaginary of, of some number. So this becomes positive. And now I can divide both sides. 
and I get my solution here. So this is the solution of the Schrodinger equation in momentum space. So now I Fourier transform back. Here is a Fourier transform back of this expression here. And now I have my wave function in coordinate space. Uh, I'm almost done. I mean, this nice wave function solves the Schrodinger equation, but here I have the wave function, and here I have the wave function at zero. So consistency demands that when I set r equals zero here and cancel this on both sides, one equals minus four pi c zero times this integral at r equals zero needs to be one. I mean, you need to satisfy that equation, which means that this is the inverse of that guy. And that guy is just the integral that I introduced before, i1, 4k equals i, chi, uh, uh, i kappa 0. So I just wrote it here. So it's the same integral I had before with that divergence. So if you did not do the liebmann schwinger uh, uh, first, you would get here and you would notice with surprise that this diverges. So here you would have to introduce the regularization. So you do exactly what, you, what we've done before. I'm skipping the steps, right? So I get this. So the only difference is that now I have this kappa 2. So I get instead of I cap, uh, IK, I get kappa 2. Minus IK, I get kappa 2. And when kappa 2 is equal to A2, that's just the, the C0 lambda that I had before. So now with this consistency equation, I, now I have the solution. I, now my, my, I got the, the, the wave function. I just Fourier transform um, this thing here. And I'm not going to give the steps. You get just the Yukawa type uh, wave function, I mean, the exponential the falling off exponential over R, which is just the form that I told you happens outside the, uh, the square well. So I, I solved in front of your eyes the delta function, the leading order of the theory, the delta function both ways, lippmann schwinger and uh, Schrodinger equation, you take your pick. They give the same result. Now, uh, it was a bit too fast. What I did here was for the bound state, in principle, for the Schrodinger equation, I also have to do the scattering. Uh, for the scattering, I have to take the wave function to be a scattering, scattering wave function, a plane wave, outgoing spherical wave, with what's called the scattering amplitude. Fourier transform here, put this in the Schrodinger equation, um, and uh, we get an equation for, for F2. And uh, again, psi of zero is the Fourier transform without, uh, with the exponential here with a factor of zero of the Fourier transform of the wave function. So this delta function here gives a one. This gives this term here, the I1 appears again. So uh, from here I get the F2, which up to a factor of four pi, is just the T2. So you see that solving the Schrodinger equation for scattering gives the same result as it should as doing the liebmann schwinger equation directly. So now I can claim I've done both. Before I go to the next leading order, let's analyze the result. So I was solving this, this equation that had uh, infinite iterations of the potential. Let me take just a case where I consider two terms. So the particles uh, uh, interact, propagate, and interact again, and compare that with just one instance of the interaction. And so the effect of that, that integral, that I1 integral, the finite part, the, the part that came from the IK, is going to be proportional to the typical momentum that I'm calling Q here. Um, there is a factor M that, ha that appears in the liebmann schwinger equation. And if, if you look at the factors of uh, four pi and so on, you see that you have an, an extra four pi. So 
You see that this is an expansion. If I want to look at this as in terms of perturbation theory, this would be an expansion in this factor here. Now, if you remember, my V2 is 4 pi over m times C0. So you see that the expansion is in Q over C0, Q times C0. So that's the expansion parameter in this equation. So now let's assume naturalness. Naturalness, I formulated it uh, in a technical sense. It was introduced by Etoff and Feldman. And their idea was that, well, if the C0 has a dependence on, on lambda here, or any parameter has a dependence on lambda, it means it's sensitive to high energy physics. So the renormalized piece there is no reason for the renormalized piece to be much smaller or much larger than the, than the cutoff dependent piece. So natural is, is the assumption that this guy here has the same size as this term when this is of the order of the breakdown scale. So in this case, then C0 renormalized is just given by the high energy scale. And then the expansion parameter becomes Q, which is small, divide by m high, which is large. So that means that I could have solved the, the Lippmann-Schwinger equation in perturbation theory in this case. And then my bound state would have a momentum of the order of the high energy scale. But the high energy scale is where the effect field theory breaks down, so it's outside the effect field theory. So within the region that the effect of field theory holds, this is a case of weak interaction where I do not have a bound state uh, within the effect field theory. Uh, in this case, if a, uh, if A2, the scattering length, is positive, I'm going to say that it's repulsion because I don't have a bound state within DFT. And uh, in this sense, the theory is very boring. It's just weak interactions. Perturbation theory holds everywhere. And there's not no interesting structure. The case that I'm interested in is that case of, of universality where there is a fine tuning scale that I called Aleph, which is much smaller than M high. In the case of the square well, that came because I, it comes when, when the, uh, the depth of the square well is close to some critical value. Um, and then uh, in this case then, I need to take C0, the renormalized value for C0, to scale as one over the small scale in order to have the bound state within the effect field theory. And the amplitude then is non-perturbative already at leading order. And this is the case that I'm going to, to continue to pursue through these lectures, because this is the interesting case of intrinsically quantum mechanical system where the uh, the wave function spills uh, way outside the, uh, the interaction range. So I'm going to consider this case of fine tuning for the leading order interaction. But I'm going to continue to assume naturalness for the other uh, parameters in the theory and see what, where it, it leads. So we've just seen that a leading order, uh, we generate a range an effective range, a term proportional to k squared, but is not a real range because it depends on the regulator. It depends on the regulator as one over lambda. So the assumption of naturalness for this uh, part of the interaction simply means that this guy here now becomes one over m high, so this term here becomes q over m high times the typical size of the unitarity term so this is going to be, this is down within the region of the effect field theory by one factor of Q over M high. So this is going to be an NLO effect. You can do the similar argument for, for higher orders. I'm not going to go into the detail since I'm already uh, running out of uh, time. Uh, I'm already late. Uh, but you can show that the shape parameter, for example, is an N cube uh, LO effect the scattering volumes for the P wave, so the analog of the scattering length, but for the P wave is also an N cube LO effect, and so on and so forth. So leading order, we're done. We are now, I'm going to, to we can now go to 
go to higher orders. I'm, as I said, I'm going to illustrate the case of NLO. But whatever order you go, you have to do what's called distorted wave perturbation theory. It's not the simple, simple perturbation theory um, where the leading order is, uh, in a sense, the free, wa uh, free wave and then the first correction is one, in, one interaction, second correction is two interactions, but I have my leading order now is non-perturbative, but I'm going to do perturbation theory on top of that. So that's distorted wave born. So let me show how this works. So now I go to next next order. I have that interaction that has two powers of momenta. This is going to be translated into powers of k square. So that's going to be a contribution to the range I expect. So and I'm attaching a superscript one to the node that's NLO. I expect the, the range to be NLO. And then I'm going to allow a small correction in the leading order interaction um, because I can. Uh, so now I have to solve the Lippmann-Schrödinger equation, but in this distorted wave approximation. So I have always one piece of the NLO potential, but I can dress this with the leading order interaction as many times as I want. The form the diagrams are much prettier than the, the explicit form of, of the lippmann schrodinger equation, but it's here in its full glory at NLO. And I have to solve this for this interaction here. So I have to put this V21 here, 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 here. And it's not that difficult. I mean, it looks a bit intimidating, but um, I follow the same, just for simplicity, I factor out this factor for pi over m because it appears everywhere. I, now I cannot make the assumption that this amplitude is going to be only function of k because my interaction here has p and p prime here, so p and p prime appear already here. So I'm not making that assumption, so I, here I'm just factoring out for pi over m. And I plug this into the previous equation. Believe me that that's what you get. Well, don't believe me because I make lots of mistakes, but uh, most likely this, uh, I didn't make a mistake on this one. And I, I'm just uh, pointed, the only point of, of writing this equation here is to point out that a new integral appears here, I3, which is similar to the one I had before, but with two extra powers of L squared. So when I, say that this, is, this has an L square here, this L, fourth, uh, L to the fourth, L square minus K square, so this is twice, uh, two powers of momentum more singular than the previous equation. So I'm going to have some number times lambda cube, uh, and then K square times the integral that I had before. But this is a new divergence that appears that I have to take care of. Um, now I take this, I take the expression I had for T20 from before, I square it and divide to get the simple expression uh, because I can write the amplitude, the sum of an amplitude at order zero plus order one in terms of this ratio here, which is written here. And here the stru structure is relatively simple. And that's why I want to, to go through this. First of all, it has a piece that's going to, be, to vanish on shell. So as far as two body system phase shifts, which are on shell quantities, this piece doesn't matter. This piece is going to, to vanish. So I'm going to focus on the other two. The other two give a contribution proportional to Q, K square. That's going to add to this one that I had from, from leading order. And then I have a constant here that depends on this awful, with this awful cut off uh, dependence. So I have to put these two expressions here, look at the on-shell amplitude, and see what I get. So on-shell I get this. So I get my IK that I had a leading order. I had the inverse of C0, the randomized C0 that I had a leading order. I have the correction that's independent of momentum, and I combine the energy uh, contributions here. So now comes a step of renormalization. I just say that this guy here has to be a number independent of, um, independent of the regulator. I choose that to denote that number 
by C2 renormalized over C0 renormalized square with a minus sign. And now there is an extra dependence here, which I, again, I'm going to call this just a number. Uh, so I'm going to use the freedom of having this term here to cancel this divergence or this cutoff dependence here. So with that, I achieved with this, 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 this C01 and C21, I achieved a result that is independent of the cutoff, again, up to higher order terms. And now I have not only a possibility of a bound state or virtual bound state, I have the, the scattering length, but now I can describe the factor range. So this is the calculation at NLO. Again, there are no infinities, no cutoff dependence, except for very small terms. I could do the same thing with the Schrodinger equation. I punt, right? Uh, I just, or, or even better, I give it as a homework, right? Um, for the bound state, for example, to calculate the energy of the bound state, you do what you do in, in quantum mechanics courses, in perturbation theory. You have your leading order wave function, you take your potential, and you take the sandwich. Good luck. Uh, scattering, the same thing. You, uh, have a, uh, you have an NLO wave function, you obtain the scattering uh, amplitude at NLO, and so on. You should get exactly the same results as you get with the Lippmann Schrodinger equation. Okay? So I'm cheating a little bit. I didn't do this case, but uh, I trust that you can do it. So now let me give you an example. Let's talk numbers and see what happens. Also something that's uh, hopefully interesting for atomic people. So let me consider one example, helium-4 atoms. Now over many, many years, people constructed many, many helium-4, helium-4 to body potentials. And they go by some funny names. Uh, two, I, I list only two here. The LM2M2 potential, or the PCKLJS potential, and these potentials are constructed using a variety of data, not only low energy and so on, and they have some uh, very detailed shapes. Um, I'm going to use these potentials. I'm going to use this as a to benchmark my 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 effect field theory. So I'm going to take them as if they were replacement for data. Why? Because they're relatively at low, en uh, low energies, uh, there's relatively low energy uh, nuclear, uh, low energy, low energy, there are relatively few low energy data. Uh, for example, there, are, there, there is data for the binding energy of the helium-4 dimer. But you see that the results are not tremendously good. Uh, this is what these potentials predict. So sort of in between the, uh, the data. There is data for, uh, there, sorry, there is, the, uh, there is a, a prediction from these potentials that there are two, um, two states for the trimer, the ground state and an excited state. There is data on the uh, relatively recent data on the excited trimer. But there's not much more data, for example, for the four body, uh, for the tetramer, uh, ground state and excited state, there's no data and so on. There's also no direct data for, as far as I know, for the scattering parameters, A2 and R2, uh, but there are predictions from these potentials that have been calculated. And there is also a uh, calculation of the van der Waals length for this, uh, for this potential, which is uh, of order 5.4 um, angstroms. So I want to take this. Uh, so in principle, I would fit the experimental data if, if there was enough. But I, I'm going to use, as I said, the potentials to f fit my results to the potential uh, input and compare with the potential itself to see how, how well my effect field theory converges. So at leading order, I'm going to use my parameter C00 to fit B2. And then at NLO, I'm going to use the other two guys to fit A2 and R2. Is the, the, the strategy clear? 
so I'm going to use those as input and I'm going to see how my predictions evolve. Now this calculation we've done a while back um, and we use in this case a local regulator which is a Gaussian. So I didn't emphasize this type of regulator because I don't get analytic uh, results but nowadays anybody can do this on the computer so at the two body level at least. So let's see what the results come out. So we fit a leading order, we fitted the B2 of one potential, let's say this one or this one here. And we looked at how we impose that this B2 is fixed, so re my, our result is renormalized, and we look at the coupling constant, and we see that it approaches asymptotically a certain value here, C0, so this is the form of the um, of the how this coupling constant runs, and if you compare with the separable regulator that I did analytically, you see that it's it's uh, has a very close form. And at this leading order, the range, as I emphasized before, the range is not calculated. I mean, it it goes to zero and the cutoff increases. We can see at which speed it goes to zero. This is a theta minus one for a separable regulator. Uh, now, at NLO, uh, this is going to be finite and on zero because I have C2. So I now fit C2 at NLO to, uh, uh, to, 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 to get a finite range. So I can, at NLO, fit A2 and R2 and see how B2 behaves as a function of these uh, this parameters. So I could fit, B, uh, so I get at leading order, I get 0.90, and then compare with the direct result from the potential. So now I'm fitting these two guys here for each one of these two potentials and, see, and seeing how B2 comes out. So B, this is, B2 is what we calculated, B2 direct is the result direct from the, uh, directly from the potential, and you see within leading order we have 8%, uh, we are 8% off at NLO, we are already within 1%. So the theory converges uh, really well. So at low energies for the physics of the dimer, you don't need this very complicated potential. Well, you wouldn't need it if you had enough data, but if, uh, if given enough data, you can uh, get very fast convergence. Okay, so before I go to... Um, leave the two-body system, I want to talk a little bit more about the unitarity limit um, because it comes with uh, some very important symmetry considerations and those are related to scale invariance. So um, as I said before, some of the systems like the helium-4 system is close to, the, to unitarity which is the limit where the scattering length goes to infinity and all the effective range parameters are zero. So let's look at this, this unitarity limit. Um, in this unitarity limit, the scale, trans uh, scale transformation plays an important role. So what's a scale transformation? Well, this is one example here. The little elephant goes continuously into the big elephant. And okay, there is some symmetry breaking here. Not everything is in the right proportion. Proportion when you uh, inflate the elephant in the, the little elephant in all directions, but it's pretty close, right? So if you neglect tusks and uh, some other details, you have pretty much a continuous transformation from little elephant to big elephant, where the system is the same. So that's what is a scale transformation. You multiply all the all the, um, the coordinates by a, couple, by a number, by a parameter, which is continuous, I'm calling alpha. Now, quantum this is classical, quantum mechanically, uncertainty principle, the momentum scales as alpha to the minus one, the energy, because I'm considering a non-relativistic system, scales as alpha to the minus two, and time, which is conjugate to energy, scales with alpha to the two. Um, so this is a scale transformation. So let's see what our action, how our action go, uh, transforms under uh, scale transformation. So the action 
is just the integral over time and space of the Lagrangian that I had before. And I'm specializing to two particles here. So I factor out a factor 2m because uh, m always appears uh, in this combination. So I just have the kinetic terms here. And I have my two-body interaction, contact, inter oops, contact interaction in leading order. So a scale transformation uh, in this case includes also, well, my, I have my cutoff. My cutoff is a momentum, so it scales as lambda to the minus one. And I have to figure out how the field scales. Well, I'm going to define the transformation of the field according to what it's called its canonical dimension, because this is going to ensure that this part of the action is going to be invariant under scale transformation. At unitarity, my C0 is given simply by this form here. Let's go back because you might have forgotten. Remember that my C0 is given by, the uh, inverse of C0 is given by this term and this term here. But at unitarity, where this, this guy here is the scattering length, at unitarity, one over the scattering length is, is zero. So that corresponds to a C0 renormalized, which is zero. So if I look at the inverse, the, uh, look at this form here, I can set to zero all these terms. And my C0 is simply given by one over the cutoff up to a constant. So, if my C0 transforms like this and lambda transforms like that, then you can see that every term in this action here is invariant under uh, scale transformation, and I have scale invariance. Now, what does scale invariance implies if, if it's exact, namely if I'm at uh, two-body unitarity, I cannot have a discrete two-body uh, state and the reason is simple, my binding energy would have to be from this transformation. The transformed binding energy has to be equal to the initial bind binding energy before transformation. So the only solution is that B2 equals zero. So I conclude that at unitarity, there is scale invariance and there are no two body bound states. As I said, in, in physical examples like helium-4, there is a dimer, but it's shallow. So this might be a good approximate symmetry. So what I have I done so far? So far, I show that certain quantum mechanical two-body systems are close to unitarity. I show that we can construct an effect field theory for this. And it uh, we can derive from it the effect of range expansion. I didn't show here. But it's been shown that another way to, to deal with this type of system called the pseudopotential from, uh, that was invented by Fermi a long time ago is also equivalent to the effect field theory. Or another way to, to deal with the system, which is to take a boundary condition at the origin, is also equivalent. And uh, in the systems, the dynamics is nearly scale invariant, invariant. So what I'm going to do for the rest of my lectures is to show that these systems are not just the effect of range expansion um, because of the role of, of many body forces. And we are going to see that continuum or continuous uh, scale invariance is broken and uh, down to discrete scale invariance. So that's what's coming. Um, what I'm doing is a generalization of the short uh, or zero range models that uh, Tobias and, and uh, Lauro talked about last, uh, last week. Uh, and the, the fact that the generalization is become, going to become even more clear when we go to the few body systems. So now, few body systems. Um, so let's, uh, let's move on. Again, we can have, we have to solve the system. We can look at uh, Lippmann-Schwinger based methods, Schrodinger equation-based Schrodinger equation, uh, equation, uh, methods. I'm going to say very quickly a couple of words about each of them. Uh, but the main issue is the relative importance of field body forces. Field body forces are there because they are allowed by the symmetry. So 
My task is not to discuss whether they are there, but at which order they appear. Are they leading order effects? Are they small effects that I can in practice neglect? And that's what we are going to do for uh, a good chunk of the rest of the lectures. So Schrodinger-based uh, methods are essentially a generalization for, for many bodies. Oh, again, I, I have the label A here. I wanted to put N. For N bodies or A bodies, you solve the Schrodinger equation exactly at leading order, and then you do perturbation theory, distorted wave perturbation theory of, at NLO. It's very convenient, uh, but not uh, compulsory in the systems to use Jacobi coordinates. And there are many methods to, to do this. Uh, the ex exact favorite method is uh, Fadeev Yakubovsky, uh, but that uh, only recently the, the five body system has been dealt with this method. It's, it's, it's not uh, easy to scale up. Um, we've done calculations with the stochastic variational method. I'm not going to go into details about that and, and also with Monte Carlo, if you want uh, more information about Monte Carlo, Lucas here, Lorenzo can, can tell you about uh, those. Um, I'm going to say a few more words about Lippmann and Schwinger based methods because they give a very clear idea of, about the importance of the three body force semi analytically. And in order to do that, a, a useful thing to do is to introduce an auxiliary field. And in this context, it was done by David Kaplan many years ago. And the idea is to introduce a field for the two-body uh, state, the dimeron field uh, corresponding to the dimer. The dimer will have a mass that is not quite two times the mass of the two particles that make it, but is going to have a slightly smaller energy if the dimer is bound. And in fact, this, the, the use of this field is not uncommon in, in, in atomic physics, even in weak uh, regimes. So the idea is that uh, instead of the Lagrangian that I had before, which contained only the field of, for the particles uh, that I'm considering, we also add a field for this two-body state, which I'm denoting by D, and it's going to have a, its mass or mass defect, whatever you want to call it, it's going to have kinetic terms with some coefficient in front. And it turns out that at leading order, uh, only the, the, this mass defect appears. At then a low, you, con you can include the contribution from, from this term and so on. Um, this field simply is, is, consists of these this two particles, so I can fix it's coupling to two particles. But I can have a three-body interaction, which in this language is just an interaction of the particle with the, with the dimer. So a leading order, what enters is the full propagator for this object is just the sum of this object as it appears in the Lagrangian. It can split into two particles and then go back to itself. So here's the geometric series completely analogous to the one I had before without this field. And you see that the amplitude is exactly the same as I had before once I renormalize my mass for this, for this particle. I just get a constant plus IK, the inverse of that. At NLO, we have the range. We have the same term we had before. The only difference here is that the interactions are energy dependent, in the dependent instead of the uh, moment, uh, momentum dependent, and therefore there is no lambda cube here, no I3. Um, but still, this guy here, corres the renormalized part of this guy here corresponds to the range. So I want to, am I at 50 already, uh, Lucas, or? Okay, so what I want to do is to discuss the three-body system in this language. So the way to do this is the scattering of the particle on the, on the dimer. Uh, I put all the kinematics here in detail. Um, but you see the, the contributions are going to be in this language with the auxiliary field representing the two-body bound state where then I'm doing the scattering, right, particle on the, on the dimer atom on the dimer, if you will, 
the dimer can split and, and send a, a, an atom to the other side and then these guys form a, a, a dimer and so on. So there is a series of diagrams here and if you do the estimate of the different contributions you are going to see that they are all the same size. So again, at leading order, you're stuck with an integral equation for this, uh, for this process. Now this uh, integral equation uh, was already discovered many, many, many years ago by Skorniakov and Termatirosian. And it takes this form here for the simplest S wave. So again, it has the form of a potential. This is just a proje pro projection of that atom exchange in the, uh, in the S wave. Trust me that that's what you get when you project. And then you have the integral part of the integral equation here. Um, and um, the same potential appears, the amplitude. So this is an integral equation. And there is a factor of lambda here. And this is, turns out to be incredibly important. So uh, trust me that if you do, if you're consider two, considering two component fermions, what happens is that this lambda is, uh, this lambda is minus a half. For bosons, is, this lambda is plus one. And for com four component fermions that I may or may not have time to come back to at the end of my, my uh, last lecture, you get two equations which are essentially a linear combination of these two. So this case is not independently that important. So the two important cases are these ones here. So, um, and this, this lambda is going to have dramatic consequences for the many body physics of, of the system. So now I have this integral equation with, let's say, either this lambda or that lambda. Um, and I need to, as usual, like in the case for the two-body system, I first need to look at the ultraviolet properties. So I consider momenta much larger than the energy and see the structure of the equation. So the equation reduces to this. And one can make an ansatz for, again, just like I did before for the for uh, the amplitude, uh, this ansatz here, and if I make this ansatz, it was made by Danilov in uh, 63, you get an equation for this power S. It's a transcendental equation, but can be solved. So if I solve this, this equation, I obtain S. And this equation depends on lambda. And that's why this lambda here is so important, because different lambdas will lead to, lead to different S's, which will leave lead to different asymptotic behaviors. Uh, let me check. I think I, should, uh, I think I should stop here today. So I did even less than I was hoping. But what I'm going to do next is that I'm going to consider two component fermions first, this lambda. I'm going to show that everything is very boring. Um, well, some, not entirely boring, but, but more boring. Then the case lambda equals one, which is actually very exciting because in this case, we are going to need a three-body force at leading order and we are going to have something called the Efimov effect. So, okay, that's for tomorrow then. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Well, you said at some point in your lecture, don't trust me, I make mistakes. <laughs> uh, at least concerning sign mistakes, the real trick is to do an even number right, of correct. sign mistakes, right? I tend to do an odd number, though. <laughs> but we have time for a quick question. Anyone? So, last week we heard a lot about uh, dipolar bosons which are about what dipolar bosons which dipolar. are okay. bosons with uh, no central type of interactions right and uh, the duo of my question would be the tensor in, in nuclear physics right okay um, how does that fit in um, effective field theory oh that's uh, that's a good question um, which i didn't want to go into but okay since you asked so as you said, that's the, uh, the analog in nuclear physics is uh, the tensor interaction here, which is essentially a dipole, dipole interaction. Um, I can do essentially everything that I've been doing here, um, 
But, uh, well, first of all, there, there is a question of scales, right? So if I do uh, this case here, still I have at very low energies, I can stick to the, uh, stick to the S wave and treat this, this tensor force and perturbation theory and uh, nothing special happens. Now, you could ask what happens in a different system, for example, dipolar atoms, where maybe, first of all, there is not this term here, the, the suppression here, right? And the potential is purely one over our cube where I cannot start with a uh, um, contact interaction theory. So I have to take my leading order interaction as being the singular interaction here. Um, well, as any singular interaction, singular interaction is something that diverges at the origin with a power of two with a certain coefficient or more. I will need to renormalize my system already at leading order, so I will need a contact interaction at leading order at the two-body system, so I, would, I cannot avoid having this, this dipolar interaction plus a contact interaction, and then, uh, but then the field body physics is going to be totally different. So in short, I can apply exactly the same methods, but everything is going to be a lot more complicated than what I present so far. Okay. Thanks for the answer. Sure. Um, Bira still has one lecture, so if you have any more questions, you can ask them. Let's okay. thank him again. Thank you. Hello, good morning, uh, good afternoon there, Professor Nazarenko, I guess. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, let's continue with the second lecture from Professor Nazarenko. Uh, please, Professor, you have the microphone now. Okay, thank you. Uh, welcome to my uh, second lecture. So, uh, just a, a brief reminder that in the end of last lecture, I uh, um, presented to you um, a vortex solution, um, in particular, a solution corresponding to one isolated vortex. And it it's, um, has a form on this screen, as, as I showed you before. Okay, now, um, if you have one vortex solution, uh, you can uh, uh, have uh, use it to obtain many vortex solutions, uh, assistance with many vortices. So well, first of all, if you complex conjugate this uh, uh, psi function, so you will get a, a vortex with a um, negative uh, circulation. So uh, instead of four pi, you will get minus four pi. This is simply because the phase will turn into uh, a will, uh, negative sign and when you take circulation, uh, that is uh, the um, change of uh, phase uh, when you go around the vortex. So you will respectively change time too. And then uh, um, you can also shift in, uh, in physical space, the position of the vortex from the uh, coordinate origin to some, uh, any other arbitrary position. And then you can take, uh, uh, and then you make such several such solutions, making several shifts or several complex conjugates, and uh, uh, consider a psi function, which is a product of such uh, 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 psi functions you obtain those shifts. And then easy to see that you will have a multi vortex solution because uh, the zeros of the product. <clears throat> will of course consist of zeros of the uh, members in, inside a, a product, right? So you can construct, and this is in fact how it is done uh, often in numerical simulations when you initiate, initiate initial state with uh, multiple vortices, you, you precisely do it uh, this way. You, you, uh, you take a product of single vortex solutions and then run, uh, run it. Of course, uh, such initial uh, uh, in, 
vortex is not uh, uh, vortices are not going to be uh, no longer uh, stationary, and they will start moving uh, if such initial condition is taken. And when they move, uh, in addition to vortices, you will see waves that are generated by vortices. Um, and I will talk about that a little bit later. But now, <clears throat> uh, so this construction is two-dimensional vortices. Or if you are in three-dimensional space, all the vortices are concentrated on straight lines parallel to each other. But in three dimensions, the uh, zeros of uh, the psi function, where the vortices are located, uh, can, uh, can concentrate on uh, arbitrary uh, curved lines, right? And as I mentioned, when I answered questions in the end of last lecture, so this, uh, if, when you have many of such lines uh, entangled uh, with uh, one another, uh, we call it a vortex tangle. And this is uh, essentially uh, how, um, uh, how the uh, uh, turbulence in um, uh, quantum fluids look like. Okay, so one illustration here taken from direct numerical simulation of gross petersky equation in three dimensions is shown here. Uh, and, and these are the, uh, what is shown here, uh, uh, lines where vorticity turns into zero. In fact, what is shown is uh, surfaces where the uh, psi uh, function is very close to zero. And therefore, these surfaces are very thin. They're, they're kind of like thin cylinders and in certain vortices. And then you can see a tangle. And also, you can see that some. Uh, vortices organize themselves in uh, loops. And if I had a movie here, so you would see that these loops propagate exactly like smoke rings in, um, uh, in uh, usual um, uh, classical fluid dynamics. So um, how can we describe such uh, vortices? Well, first of all, uh, it's uh, easier to understand how to describe such vortices if the um, distances between nearby vortices are uh, greater than their radius, much greater than their radius. And I remind you that their radius is, um, uh, uh, is of order of so-called called healing length, healing length, which is, uh, uh, de uh, depends on the, uh, density of background fluid as one over square, square root of rho. And so um, in this situation, if uh, the vortices are separated much uh, greater distances than the healing length, the dominant term in the uh, energy becomes the kinetic energy. So this term, if I express it in terms of density uh, and velocity like usual, in the fluid representation. So this is a density. You see, it's a usual kinetic density, right? Uh, except uh, of factor one uh, quarter here instead of one half. And so this factor is an artifact of uh, our choice of coefficients in the uh, gross petersky equation. So if we chose uh, to have a half coefficient in, in front of the uh, Laplace in German gross test equation, that would be exactly half. But uh, this, uh, uh, we should not get confused with that because uh, one, one equation or one system can be uh, obtained from another by simple uh, uh, rescaling of the variables. And so um, in this case, um, you see when vort vortices uh, are moving, each other, uh, and when they're separated by large distances, the, uh, the velocity they induce at each other position are slow. Uh, it is much slower than the speed of sound, and, it, and they're kind of moving like an, an incompressible fluid. That's why the compressible energy, that is the other part of the energy, is much smaller than the kinetic energy, and, we, uh, and we, it can be neglected. 
So this is a situation where sound waves uh, uh, can be neglected during motion works. So let's, for, for, for example, consider what's happening, first of all, in 2D case, two-dimensional case. So consider a system in, in uh, which you have um, n vortices and uh, each of uh, each vortex pair is separated by uh, distances much greater than the filling line. Okay, so then that energy that I had uh, here in the previous screen, okay, I can um, represent it. I can first of all notice that each vortex has a, uh, a um, you know, a hollow core where density goes into zero in its center, right? And this, whole, this core is kind of rigid, okay? So it's not, uh, uh, it cannot be easily deformed than in uh, a classical fluids. So it's kept rigid by the quantum pressure term. And in fact, uh, the, um, uh, if I just neglect uh, the, um, the fact that the vortex is hollow and I assume that density is uh, constant throughout the fluid, I wouldn't change much the, uh, the energy at all because the, ener the, this part, the, because the energy depletion is only within a very small radius healing length uh, around the vortex. And most of the vortex energy is actually concentrated uh, away from the vortex core. Because, uh, because of the fact that velocity uh, uh, decays, decays very slowly as we go outside of the vortex center, algebraically, or only like one over distance, as we, was, uh, as, uh, uh, we saw in the one vortex solution, uh, and uh, it, which is true in, uh, uh, for multiple vortices too. So we can ignore, uh, uh, we can then approximate this uh, energy, uh, assuming that rho is constant and for simplicity, let's say it's uh, constant equal to one. And then we introduce, um, when we, we do integration by part uh, in the uh, in, in energy, uh, and we introduce the um, so-called stream function and vorticity. Okay, so uh, when I um, had velocity squared, so I, uh, you see velocity in terms of stream functions contains derivatives. So if I write out this uh, equation in terms of uh, stream function, that will be gradient of stream function uh, squared in, in velocity. But then I uh, do integration by part, uh, and I have a stream function times the Laplace of stream function, uh, just as written here. Okay, you see, then uh, here I have a Poisson equation for the uh, st stream function. Uh, so I can invert it, I can find the inverted Laplace, right? And uh, <clears throat> uh, so um, if also, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, vorticity field, right? So the, uh, I can represent as a point vortices concentrated in, in, uh, in points. So I can represent it as delta functions, right? So all of the circulation uh, is, is uh, made, of, um, made by these uh, points. And so remember I told you, that the circulation, in, you know, you can represent a surface integral of um, of, uh, of the uh, um, uh, of vorticity when you go around the curve, and so the uh, so I, I put now uh, this vorticity exactly at, at the positions, and I assume that the uh, circulations have. Uh, only single charge vortices, either uh, plus or, uh, or minus for pi. So then in, in this case, so if I, um, uh, 
if I uh, invert the, uh, this equation, this Poisson equation, so uh, with uh, 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 stream functions like that, uh, uh, with the vorticity uh, like this, so uh, you can see that you perhaps from the course of PDEs, you, you know that if in a right, if the right hand side, in this case, left hand side of the equation have a delta function, such a solution is called Green's function, right? And so in Green's functions of Laplacian in 2D uh, is a log logarithm. Uh, and so now I uh, have several uh, delta functions and therefore I have some of such logs and that will be the stream function. And so then I plug this uh, stream function and, and this vorticity uh, uh, back in a, uh, energy like this, uh, and upon uh, uh, and, uh, and that will give me, and and, that, and then I can integrate uh, using the delta functions. And when I do that, uh, my uh, uh, integral of energy converts into a sum. And so uh, then my energy, which is also Hamiltonian of such system of point vortices, uh, uh, becomes a sum of. Uh, of such uh, uh, contributions of uh, uh, pairwise contributions. So each vortex interacts with another vortex uh, with uh, 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 you know, the potential uh, uh, equal to log of uh, uh, difference. And uh, so, and then if I, uh, if I know that this is a Hamiltonian, um, and in fact, in such dynamics, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the <clears throat> coordinate x and y, two dimensional coordinate uh, of each point vortex, uh, serves as a, uh, a canonically con conjugated uh, um, Hamiltonian variables. So by integrating such Hamiltonian, then I get the uh, equation of motion for each vortex. Uh, so you see, so the vortex position of vortex number k uh, is um, uh, is moving, and its velocity uh, is uh, uh, equal uh, to the contributions of velocities produced by uh, all other vortices. For example, vortex J induces velocity uh, in the position of vortex uh, k. Uh, precisely as written here. So I, I sum over all such vortices uh, except for the vortex itself. I, I, uh, <laughs> I get rid of the self-induced velocity because vortex doesn't move uh, itself. And so uh, uh, this way, you see, um, uh, I reduced in, in such um, approximation when vortices are separated by long distances, I, I reduce the uh, partial differential equation, uh, our gross Pitevsky equation, into a system, a multidimensional system of ordinary differential equations uh, for the positions of vortices. So, uh, <clears throat> and, and you can you can think of uh, this system of point vortices, therefore, uh, as um, as a gasp of point vortices that move uh, by, uh, by moving each other. And when you have many of such vortices, you can think of it as two-dimensional quantum uh, turbulence. And uh, uh, the uh, final remark here, that this uh, equation for point vortices is, is a very classical uh, equation that is precisely the same as, as in classical uh, uh, fluid dynamics, right? The, the only difference that the circulations here must be precisely quantized, whereas in classical fluid, they can take arbitrary uh, um, real uh, values. So uh, such a strategy also works in, uh, uh, in 3D. So if I have a vortex tunnel or, or say a set of uh, vortex lines, uh, whose uh, separation one from another is much uh, uh, greater than the helium length, 
And additionally, that the curvature radius of such vortex line is also much greater than the, its the, uh, uh, radius of the vortex line. So then uh, I can come to an, an equivalent of what we just consider for a, a two-dimensional um, uh, system. And so uh, this is called uh, uh, Biersavar uh, equations. So, it's a, 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 so if we have a, li a vortex line char characterized by, by element of, of this lens R, uh, which, is, uh, which is a function of distance along the vortex line, which is uh, here, uh, uh, and uh, also time. So this, uh, this line, kind of a, a one parametric line. And um, so uh, for this uh, particular element of the line, we see that uh, its motion uh, is uh, given by velocity contributions of all the other elements of uh, the, uh, this particular vortex line and the other vortex lines. Um, okay, so again, it's uh, the same equation, a uh, very similar equation to uh, what we would have in uh, uh, classical fluid dynamics, except the circulation might be four pi uh, 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 quantized. So, uh, but um, this is another important uh, um, difference in the problem. It's related to the fact so in classical fluids, vorticity is uh, not usually singular, it's distributed in, uh, over, um, gradually over physical space. Here, the fact that it is uh, strongly uh, concentrated on the lines, okay, uh, leads, to, uh, leads to the consequence that this equation, strictly speaking, mathematically doesn't make sense. So because this integral will be divergent uh, as, um, as uh, the integration variable S tends to R, okay? So you will see you, you have here kind of zero or zero singularity, uh, but what we have in denominator as third power. And so therefore, the, we, if you work it out, it's actually logarithmic divergence, okay, so it's a, it's a mild divergence, but still divergence. And one has to fix it, and normally, uh, the, uh, in order to fix it, you, uh, you could speculate that uh, when we assumed the assumption, uh, we, uh, we assumed that the um, uh, vortex radius can be neglected in our consideration. Okay, but uh, th this works only uh, until the um, two vortex elements that we consider, uh, line elements that we consider become uh, to, uh, close to each other to the distances of order of the uh, vortex radius. So therefore, this integral has to be um, cut off uh, at a scale so that uh, we, we should assume that uh, we, we should ignore contributions into this integral uh, such that modulus of R minus S is greater than the healing length. Okay, so this is all kind of hand waving fix of this uh, equation. And this equation being used very effectively to model superfluid uh, uh, vortices in three dimensions. However, Having said that, the uh, derivation of, 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 uh, of this equation based from gross Pierski model is rather non-trivial and was only done uh, uh, recently, uh, about four years, four or five years ago. And indeed it was shown that the, uh, the, uh, this description, the uh, correct description, asymptotic uh, uh, description uh, in a case of uh, when the radius is, uh, uh, curvature radius is greater than the healing length, uh, leads to this model with a cutoff, uh, which is of order of the healing length, but not exactly the healing length. There is some numerical coefficient of order, of order one. So, so this is kind of justification of, of uh, this approach that's been used for quite a long time.
but okay. Uh, uh, right, okay, so uh, we, we can assume uh, that in our vortex tunnel, initially at least, such vortex lines have big uh, core radius and they also far apart from each other, but the vortex lines move and they can uh, collide with each other. And so, in other words, they can approach the distances which are uh, of the same order as the vortex radius. Okay, and then we, uh, we, we should ask ourselves what, what happens then. We just we established the description uh, of, uh, based on BSLR in this particular narrow areas uh, uh, become invalid. So what happens in this case, okay, so actually is a so-called vortex reconnection um, that as was uh, noted by numerical simulations of two individual vortex lines, uh, um, first in a, a paper by Koplik and Levine. Okay, uh, so uh, in 2D, similar uh, uh, situation can occur when two vortices approach to a distance of order of the healing length, uh, so they actually can, uh, can positive and negative vortex can annihilate with each other. Or conversely, uh, they can also get created and we will now uh, consider such situations. So vortex reconnections. So the uh, uh, vortex reconnections, um, uh, I, I remind you that um, if uh, we had uh, Kelvin uh, circulation theory valid, vortex uh, the connections would be impossible because circulation, uh, conservation of circulation. And I told you in classical fluids, uh, uh, viscosity breaks uh, um, uh, Kelvin theorem, but in uh, uh, quantum fluids, it is quantum pressure. Okay, in fact, uh, the, um, you, uh, one can uh, understand and, and describe what happens locally due, during the reconnection moment by making a, an observation that the, um, because a, a vortex uh, core is hollow, this means density goes to zero at its center. During, during the reconnection moment, at the point of reconnection, okay, so the, um, uh, the density at the vicinity of a connection point is very low and therefore the linear terms and non-linear terms in the, in the Gross-Petalsky equation uh, uh, become uh, much smaller than the, than the linear terms. And so the, the dynamics essentially locally is described by just usual linear Schrodinger equations. So you can see here, it's, a, it's actually what I'm showing you here is the analytical solution obtained for vortex reconnection based on exactly this uh, uh, assumption that the linear dynamics is dominating in, in, in near the reconnection point. You see two vortices, one on, the, on the, or going over another uh, initially, and then they uh, go in touch again, as I, I, uh, I um, like before, an illustration before what is shown here is the isosurfaces of density, uh, some small density value, so that the vortices where density is zero are right inside of these uh, uh, vortex tubes. And so you see they, they touch, they interact, and then they reconnect. Okay, so they were originally like that, and now, uh, uh, now um, they are connected in a different way. So, uh, <clears throat> How, how can we use a linear Schrodinger equation to describe uh, such a, a, a situation? Uh, well, we, uh, the, we can consider the, uh, the uh, very simple situation where um, initially, uh, remember, uh, uh, Psi is a complex field, complex function, right? And so we can take uh, for real part of such function uh, initially, we can take it to be um, uh, equal to uh, some quadratic function like this, ax 
uh, squared minus b y squared plus c z with a b and c uh, being some constants right okay so <clears throat> Uh, then the uh, and for imaginary part, uh, we uh, we take another constant d uh, uh, times z, the third uh, coordinate, right? If we do that, we actually just plug straight away, plug this. Uh, uh, well, okay, actually, um, with these initial conditions, I can tell you that the solution of linear Schrodinger equation will be such that the uh, uh, real part will remain the same time independent, but the imaginary part will uh, depend on time as shown here, some with some uh, uh, um, constant V, which is uh, 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 to be found from uh, um, uh, the other uh, substitution into the uh, uh, linear Schrodinger equation, right? So where is the vortex located then? The, uh, the vortex is located where psi is zero. So psi is zero means both the real and imaginary part of psi is uh, zero, right? And so what do we see here? When the real part of, uh, of psi is zero, it's an equation of um, hyperboloid, right? And the, where, um, imaginary psi is zero. It's equation for a plane, uh, which is perpendicular to Z axis. And this plane is moving along Z uh, in time. Okay. So uh, by plugging into, so here's a plug into linear Schrodinger equation, right? For uh, both the real imaginary part of it. So you see, if I separate, uh, uh, you know, for real part, uh, the imaginary part of Schrodinger equation is this, and the real part is this. Okay, uh, if I plug in that um, expressions uh, in uh, these equations, I can see that uh, these uh, equations are satisfied uh, uh, for uh, if I take uh, value of velocity of uh, a constant v uh, as follows related to. Uh, as a two a minus b divided by uh, d. So, okay, so the vortex again, it's intersection uh, of two surfaces, hyperboloid and, uh, and a moving plane. And um, here's the illustration, what it, what it looks like, right? So at the moment, uh, t equal to zero, the, uh, this, the plane, uh, and hyperboloid, they both pass through uh, the coordinate origin. And the intersection is just two straight lines as shown here. So vortices on two straight lines. But if I take uh, T a little bit less than zero, the plane will be below the uh, hyperboloid. And the intersection will be along these lines, right? And if I take T greater than zero, it will be, uh, like this, so intersection will be like that. So you see the vortex lines change their topology by reconnecting during the moment, uh, uh, during, at, at the moment t equal to zero. And one can then use this uh, uh, solution and plug it back into the uh, gross Pitesky equation and take into account small nonlinearity and recursively reconstruct the exact solution for the vortex reconnection in all orders of nonlinearity. Uh, it will be a uh, solution in the form of infinite series. Okay, so now uh, when one, you, uh, uh, coming back to the uh, description, so this, uh, this, this model was used for modeling superfluid turbulence, uh, uh, starting from pioneering uh, work of Klaus Schwartz. Uh, in fact, he used, he used uh, approximation to the SLR called uh, local induction approximation, but I'm not going to go into details uh, uh, 
of that. But what's important that Schwartz recognized the importance of vortex reconnections. And he um, introduced an ad hoc numerical procedure that uh, each time vortices uh, uh, approach to each other at a, at a particular given distance of the uh, Killian length of what, uh, the vortex radius, he uh, reconnect them uh, uh, in this way and lets them move further. And so such the SLR description equations complemented with uh, the reconnection procedure has been used very effectively since uh, for modeling of vortex tangles and, and superfluid turbulence. And so, uh, but the reconnections is not the only thing that can happen to uh, vortices in uh, three dimensions. Um, if I have, for example, I can, I can use the same idea uh, to start with initial condition, uh, which is intersection of a second order surface and first order surface. But now let me consider intersection of uh, paraboloid and a, and a moving plane. Okay, and then exactly the same way as, uh, as I obtain solution uh, from linear Schrodinger the equation, I can obtain solution for, uh, for shrinking ring. I start with a ring, and then it shrinks, then it shrinks to nothing, and then vortex ring disappears. So it's all, uh, uh, all can be modeled uh, like this. And indeed, the uh, things like that do happen in uh, superfluid turbulence. Uh, vortices can disappear and they can uh, uh, transform the energy into acoustic component, into sound. In fact, if I don't have force in, in three-dimensional vortex tango, uh, this is uh, uh, exactly what is typically happening uh, all the time. So vortex tango will decay in precisely this fashion. So all the vortex lines experience some reconnections, uh, create vortex rings, and the vortex rings uh, uh, shrink to nothing. And, um, and, and remember, vortex rings, uh, vortices are defects uh, of phase, right? This means we remove defects from our system and we get perfectly coherent phase, perfectly coherent condensate state uh, uh, by, by such decay of uh, uh, turbulence, including vortices. Now, uh, I mentioned before to you that the, uh, there is also one other type of waves, Kelvin waves uh, on, on vortex lines. But we postponed this until now uh, because uh, we, uh, you know, we needed to first uh, discuss what the vortex lines are. So imagine you have a vortex line and imagine you have a, a helical disturbance of such a, a vortex line. Okay, it turns out that if you do that, the vortex line has some sort of um, elasticity. And this uh, disturbance, this helical disturbance will start propagating along the vortex line. And this is a very important uh, uh, kind of wave. Uh, it is important because it is considered to be the main dynamical uh, mechanism that, uh, that uh, is responsible for uh, energy exchanges uh, at, the, at, uh, at small scale uh, superfluid turbulence. So, uh, okay, so how can I consider, uh, how can I derive uh, uh, frequencies for such waves? Well, it's actually quite involved uh, and one can uh, use the BSLR model that I described to you because you see these waves are fully three-dimensional, right? But I can do some sort of shortcut here for you uh, and uh, derive it based on dimensional analysis. So it very often happens that uh, for a particular physical example of waves, uh, there's only one essential uh, physical dimensional parameter that is important and from which you can uh, uh, induce a lot of uh, uh, properties of the waves. 
In this particular case, what's important is the circulation of the vortex line kappa. Okay, and previously we called it gamma. Okay, so kappa is just to indicate it's a single, uh, um, single charge vortex. Okay, so it's four pi in our model. Okay, so it's four pi in our model, but in, in reality, right, if, if I uh, used um, uh, gross petersky equation in with physical dimensions, this uh, velocity circulation would also have physical dimensions, not just four pi, right? It would have physical dimensions. What physical dimensions it would have? Remember that the circulation is, uh, is the contour integral of velocity field, right? Velocity has dimension of uh, length over uh, time, right? meters per second. And the line integral integration uh, adds another length dimension. So the dimension, physical dimension of uh, circulation is length squared divided by time. Uh, okay, uh, and uh, physical dimension of uh, wave vector is uh, um, one over L just simply because it's two pi divided by the, uh, by the wavelength, right? And the uh, frequency is, of course, uh, has physical dimension one over second, right? One over time. And how, do, like, how can I make dimension of uh, one over time of frequency out of uh, wave vector k, one over L, and circulation L squared over T? This can be uh, done in, in, uh, in uh, only by combining them uh, in such a combination, right? So if omega equal to uh, circulation times k squared. Uh, of course, this uh, does not uh, predict for us the uh, could be some dimensionless numerical factor C. Okay, so, and, um, and this is pretty much what uh, uh, is happening. So approximately indeed, the Kelun waves have uh, this uh, uh, kind of frequency, but uh, this uh, a little bit of uh, correction has to be uh, taken into account if you do it rigorously. It's related to the fact that the um, the Biasavar integral has to be cut off at the uh, Hilian length, and therefore Hilian length is actually another dimensional parameter that enters into being, but it's less uh, important than the circulation right? because of the divergence is only logarithmic. And yet it, it modifies the dispersion relation a little bit. So you see the true relation that, that obtained from the SLR equation is almost like the one we just obtained the, uh, cheaply from uh, the dimensional considerations but it has a logarithmic correction. Okay, so um, Xi, I remind you, is the Hilian length. And uh, gamma is the so-called earlier constant. It's just a number, numerical number of order one. Okay. So um, now, uh, okay. Um, now that I introduced waves, uh, the uh, properties uh, like, uh, reconnection, um, annihilation, and uh, killing waves. So let's let's now start considering turbulence, right? So uh, I remind you, turbulence because of uh, fluid representation of gross potential equation, we expect a lot of properties in quantum systems uh, uh, like fluids. Uh, but we'll so uh, and so like in classical fluids, then. Uh, um, will be, okay, so, uh, uh, but be, before we consider what are these properties that are similar in quantum and classical turbulence, let us remind ourselves some basic ideas and facts on hydrodynamic turbulence, right? So, um, so broadly speaking, turbulence is, uh, is a state, chaotic state of uh, motion of a fluid in which many, um, scales of motion are excited simultaneously and they're interacting with each other and transferring energy uh, between each other. Okay, and so um, in the way, um, 
what's important to understand for this, describing such a um, uh, turbulent state, such chaotic motion, one can't just simply consider uh, a particular realization of, of such a chaotic flow starting with initial condition. But, but the theory has to be statistical because, uh, because tiny deviations from the initial conditions lead to very soon to dramatic deviations uh, in, the, uh, in the state of the system later on in time. And the average state, the, the stati uh, um, actually uh, quickly forgets of the initial state we are starting with. And therefore we have to start, uh, we seek for a statistical description rather than deterministic of, uh, of uh, in turbulence theory. And uh, the concept, the very fundamental concept uh, that uh, allows us <clears throat> to um, understand turbulence is the concept of turbulent cascades introduced by uh, Richardson. Okay, so you perhaps uh, know about the, heard about uh, the verse, the, the poem that he uh, uh, wrote about such a cascade and energy transfer from uh, large worlds to little worlds, uh, kind of rewarding the, the famous poem of uh, uh, Jonathan Swift. Um, so what is the cascade? Okay, so basically Richardson said, uh, I actually, a small remark for you. So that Richardson uh, is also known uh, uh, as a pioneer mathematician who introduced the concept of fractals of, of uh, scale invariant objects of uh, some scale invariants. And so like, for example, the, uh, what is the length of the coast of England? Uh, and he came with a paradoxical uh, conclusion that this length is infinite because it's fractal, right? So one dimensional length is infinite and it has to be in its dimension uh, uh, greater than one. And so, uh, and this, and it's not surprising then that in turbulence, he also used this idea for scale invariance. Uh, what he said is that, okay, so if I force my system at some large scale motions, and I dissipated uh, very at very small scales by uh, uh, by viscosity. Um, then, in between of these two scales, there will be transfer of energy from larger uh, scales of motion, larger eddies, to smaller ones in a step by step cascade uh, uh, way. And if we uh, at a particular scale of motion, which is much smaller than the forcing scale, and but much greater than dissipation scale, it doesn't matter how uh, um, the uh, uh, the system forgets how it uh, was, uh, how energy was introduced, and how energy is dissipated. Uh, what only matters that the amount of energy per unit time. Uh, transferred to uh, to this particular scale from large eddies to smaller ones, and this is called the uh, energy cascade. So the um, this energy cascade is uh, um, uh, can also conveniently be represented in Fourier space, where the uh, length scale corresponds to one over wave number. Right, so dimension it's like that. And so then cascade uh, from large scales to small scales in Fourier space will be, uh, will correspond to cascade from small wave numbers at which energy was introduced to large wave numbers where viscosity works uh, in a step-by-step -step fashion. So there is no short circuits from force and state to uh, uh, dissipation scale directly energy uh, uh, transfer. Energy has to go through many steps 
before it uh, reaches the dissipation scale. And so, and this um, property that it goes in a such a uh, step-like fashion uh, is called locality of turbulence. And this is precisely why the properties of uh, turbulence are universal in the sense that they don't remember what, what, in what precisely way it was uh, introduced at a small wave number or dissipated at a uh, large wave number. All that matters is the rate of energy uh, uh, transfer through, uh, uh, through scales. So um, this is actually quite simple picture, but it is fundamental in turbulence and in fact, it's a central, uh, um, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a foundational stone for the Kamagorov obukhov theory of uh, three-dimensional turbulence. So what is this uh, theory is about? Okay, this theory uh, allows us to obtain the scaling properties of the energy distribution uh, uh, over scales or equivalently over, uh, over the wave numbers. Okay, so um, how we do that? Uh, okay, first of all, let's introduce the energy spectrum. So uh, to do that, we uh, a definition of the three-dimensional energy spectrum is via the Fourier transform. So we have to take second two-point correlator of velocity field. Okay, so in two points separated by distance r, and uh, for it transform it with respect to the separating distance r. Okay, so uh, further, um, we can uh, consider a state which is uh, homogeneous, which is such that we are in infinite space and statistically all, uh, all our correlators so, or our statistical uh, quantities are independent uh, of uh, the uh, distance x. So then it will be only dependent, spectrum only dependent on K. Moreover, we can consider a situation where statistically, turbulence has the same properties in all directions. Uh, you can rotate your system and you get the same uh, property, including the, the spectrum. This means that the spectrum is independent of the direction of K. Uh, wave vector, but only dependent on, on its modulus. Okay, if uh, uh, we, we know it also from definition uh, that you see, if we integrate the uh, energy spectrum uh, over the entire K space, right, we can do it uh, using this uh, complex exponential that will give us delta function of R and, and therefore we will get that the uh, physical space density uh, of uh, kinetic energy is uh, equal to the integral so of the um, uh, 3D energy spectrum. Now the spectrum is uh, isotropic and uh, homogeneous. Uh, we can uh, actually, we, we don't need distribution in three dimensional Fourier space, because we know that every di direction is uh, equivalent. Uh, and so we can integrate out the angle variables in, uh, in the uh, energy spectrum and introduce one dimensional energy spectrum, uh, which is density only in modulus K space. And easy to see that if, uh, you know, uh, angle integration, will give you the factor four pi k squared, which is the, the uh, uh, surface area of, of a sphere with radius uh, k, right? So that's what happens when you integrate out the angle variable. And, uh, and, and this is precisely the object to this one dimensional uh, spectrum of energy, one dimensional because it's only um, distribution in uh, one-dimensional variable modulus k, uh, so uh, about which uh, uh, kolmogorov obukhov theory is making predictions. So in line with uh, uh, Richardson ideas, uh, Kolmogorov and Obukhov assumed 
that, uh, uh, okay, in the situations when forcing the wave number and uh, the dissipation wave number are separated, and we can, in, for the wave numbers that are deeply inside the uh, range in between, uh, which is called the inertial range of turbulence. Okay, so uh, the turbulence properties are uh, universal. Uh, and only determined by the uh, total flux of energy through scale pool. So what's the dimension of the, okay, now uh, we, uh, we uh, use the dimensional analysis. So we say, what is the, exactly uh, the uh, dimension of such flux of energy through scales? Well, you see, so if we consider a steady state, so, so the amount of energy that goes through uh, a particular uh, um, wave number k is the same as it was uh, produced uh, at the forcing scale um, kf and the same as uh, it is dissipated in uh, um, dissipation uh, wave number. And so it is just the uh, energy uh, density, which has dimension of velocity squared, per unit time, right? We produce a particular energy uh, per unit time in a, in a unit volume of uh, uh, physical space. And because of that, velocity has a dimension L squared over T squared, uh, L over T. So velocity squared has dimension L squared over uh, T squared. So the uh, energy fluxes then has dimension L squared over uh, T cubed, right? And the spectrum itself has dimension u squared over k. Um, that it follows from this expression 32. Okay, so you simply, okay, so you consider dimension. So here you have uh, L squared over uh, T squared. And on the right hand side, you have E in the description uh, divided by L, right? Okay, so. Then, uh, uh, so what then Kalmagorov noticed that there is only one way you can uh, uh, obtain dimension of the energy spectrum from the dimension of the energy flux epsilon and the um, wave number itself. And this is the famous combination uh, that is called the Kalmagorov minus five thirds spectrum of Kolmogorov the uh, uh, minus half its Kolmogorov spectrum. Again, like in a dimensional analysis we used uh, a little bit earlier for uh, the, to obtain the frequency of the Kilian waves, uh, all dimensional analysis only works up to a dimensionless uh, uh, constant, right? So this very simple uh, consideration, uh, uh, very basic, but uh, it, uh, it's essential uh, um, it's very essential for the theory of turbulence, and it's very well confirmed over a great range of uh, uh, physical situations uh, where turbulence is implemented and where it is approximately homogeneous and isotropic. And the value, experimentally, the numerical value of the Kamagorov constant is uh, equal to approximately 1.6. And um, so, but uh, one has to note here that um, beyond, the theory of turbulence beyond this um, uh, dimensional analysis gets very quickly, very uh, involved and very complicated and, the, uh, and there's no uh, full theory, uh, theory of turbulence constructed to, to, the, to the present day as such. Okay, there's still a lot of uh, uh, work to be done and this, uh, 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 okay. So, um, like uh, uh, put in, uh, uh, by uh, Richard Feynman, it is the last, uh, un uh, last un unresolved, uh, uh, great unresolved problem of classical uh, physics, uh, the uh, turbulence. Okay, so. Now, 
Okay, I, I guess um, since since I have uh, just less than three minutes, I'm going to stop um, my second lecture here and take uh, some questions from you if you have any. Please. Okay, uh, we have time for question. Please, Professor. Uh, hi, Nazarenko. Thank you very much for the nice talk. I have uh, two simple questions. One, if, one is uh, when I have a ring, a Wartz ring, and I apply the Biosava law, I see that uh, the ring is always uh, growing up because uh, uh, due to the for mutual force, they always grow up. But uh, when we see simulations, we see sometimes that, uh, and not using the Biosava, but using the gross and the mean field stuff, we see that sometimes uh, rings uh, shrink and disappear, as you said. So why is that? Uh, the Biosava does not work when uh, uh, we have some dimension on the vortice that's compatible with the distance or something? What is the limitation and why we observe that? Okay, so in Biasava, if you take a perfect ring, uh, it will uh, not uh, expand actually. It will, it will supposed to propagate, uh, propagate like a smoke ring without change. It will propagate uh, uh, for infinite distance, right? Okay, so, um, uh, however, so uh, BSOR uh, 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 description does not take into account acoustic disturbances that are um, uh, on background of the condensate. And if they do take into account uh, uh, those, then the ring will exchange energy with them. In fact, uh, the acoustic disturbances uh, that uh, through which the ring moves. Okay, so uh, you know that in, um, in superfluids, uh, they often say that uh, the acoustic component or phonon component, it's, uh, it's uh, like a normal fluid component, right? It's like effectively on coarse grain uh, sense, it's a, it's a normal uh, fluid. And motion of the uh, ring through such uh, normal fluid uh, implies friction. And so during this friction, vortex ring will uh, exchange energy uh, with normal fluid and shrink to nothing. That's what is happening. And so, of course, uh, in, uh, if you're talking, if you don't like speaking about normal fluid here, but just simply acoustic waves. You can say uh, vortex ring scatters, scatters uh, uh, acoustic waves when it's propagating through them, or maybe vice versa. The acoustic waves will scatter from the vortex ring. And when they scatter, they don't preserve the energy and momentum. They will exchange with the ring. And, and, uh, and so this is why, um, uh, so, indeed, to answer to your question, so BSR uh, description does not take this into account. It can, perhaps, uh, if, if, you, um, if you take uh, to into account additional forces, additional terms to BSR to describe interaction uh, with a normal component. Okay. Well, now there is a second question. Is that okay? Oh, I know. Uh, my second question is, uh, when you define the energy spectrum in 1D, you know, that uh, you just multiply by 4 pi k square times the 3D spectrum. Uh, that is only true when you have uh, uh, isotropy on the momentum distribution in the 3D. If you do not have you should uh, average in the angle, right? So instead of the 4 pi, 
that appears from the integration of the angle will be, I think, more correct to integrate on the angle because if you have a fluctuation on, the, on any k uh, in any direction, that will be taken account and that does not modify any of the further considerations, right, in having the 1D. Okay, so um, the, uh, you're absolutely right. So the, uh, this uh, simple formula relating 1D and 3D spectrum is only uh, valid for uh, the isotropic spectrum and that you need to uh, just leave the full integration over angle uh, if, uh, if this is not the case. So whether it modifies or not uh, the uh, uh, further considerations, well, it, um, uh, you see, the, it, 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 it can change a lot of things, of course. If, uh, if you have an isotropic turbulence, it's, it's not going to be necessarily uh, has such as, well, okay, first of all, in the first, uh, in the further consideration, you get Kalnagorov spectrum, which is isotropic, right? Which is isotropic. O obviously, it would be contradiction in terms. If you say spectrum, your spectrum is anisotropic, and you get something which is isotropic. Whether your angle average spectrum can be of Kalnagorov type, perhaps approximately it can be, in, in fact, in, uh, on a, a real uh, experiments in turbulence, spectrum is never uh, truly uh, fully isotropic or isotropic or, or uh, homogeneous, and yet the spectrum is uh, amazingly uh, observed quite well. Um, but mathematically speaking, uh, you know the uh, things get m much more complicated with uh, uh, you know if you start considering uh, strongly an an anisotropic uh, systems. Wanderlei. Hi, Sergei. Thank you Hi. for the lecture. Um, you showed us an analytical study of the vertex root connections. I'm wondering if with that appro those approximations you also neglect, neglect the sound or it is considering in that model? Okay, so this is actually pretty uh, uh, interesting. So uh, I don't neglect sound, uh, you see. So uh, yes and no. Uh, I, I consider the, the solution very locally near a reconnection time, a uh, 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 reconnection point. And I construct solution as a, as a series uh, which has a finite radius of convergence both in space and time. You see, and, the, and this, in fact, this series converge only uh, within the distances, uh, convergence radius is only of order of, of uh, uh, a vortex core radius. But within this vortex core radius, the uh, notion of sound doesn't make sense. To ask what uh, what is uh, where the sound is, the sound is uh, outside of the vortex core, right? And 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 this we uh, uh, with these solutions we can't say anything about, right? So we don't neglect it, but we just don't know. Uh, we 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 just can't get to these positions where sound is important. So I was thinking for a while, and maybe still it is possible to improve uh, uh, convergence of such uh, uh, series uh, solutions by considering maybe have some, some cure like uh, um, Pade approximants or, or, or something like that. Uh, but um, um, it, it seems a little bit complicated. I, I think it's um, uh, uh, probably uh, I, I should admit that this description is uh, only local, only o o on the scale of what we score radius, uh, in that uh, to, to describe sound, it, so it would probably, uh, at, at least at the moment, 
it's not able to do that, not able to describe uh, 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 sound. Okay, thanks. More question? So, if there are no more questions, let's close the morning session by thanking to Professor Nazarenko again. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Professor. Uh, see you tomorrow. See you. Thank you.